so um, there's an interesting thought <coughs> that was dropped into the chat, um, which is about going underwater. And I think that that might be a, a fun thing to, to think about. I have, at this point, I, um, I, don't, I do not have experience drawing underwater. Um, although before our, our, this summer, our nature journaling team is going to go to the Galapagos and I'm gonna bring some gear with me there. I'm going to test some strategies um, with my snorkel in a, in a local pool before I go. Um, and we actually do have, um, hey, Vultures, would you be, would you be um, available to talk a little bit about drawing underwater with us today? Yeah, okay, cool. I'm gonna bring on one of our, um, a, a, an, an amazing part of our nature journaling community. Um, Vultures um, is a, a, a mad windsurfer and also a diver and um, has been exploring a little bit with uh, sketching underwater. Um, so we'll have a chance to check in with um, Vultures. And then I'll also say some things about kind of the way that, some weird things that light does as you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So um, let's, um, let me um, bring in, um, hey Vultures, I'm gonna make you a co-host. Check this out. There's power. So now you can unmute yourself and um, add you into the spotlight here. Um, Walter, it's good to see you. Hi. Yep. Good to see you too. Um, so you uh, could you tell us a little bit about your um, your experience, nature journaling underwater, and some of the the techniques and strategies that you've tried so far, things that you're planning on trying and um, just uh, some of those those logistics. That's it's really cool that you've done this. I've only thought about it, so I've never tried it myself. But I want to um, before the Galapagos trip. I want to kind of uh, get out and uh, kind of geek out with a little bit, so I'll be better prepared. What has your experience been? Well, uh, I have to say that I haven't uh, done it that much uh, as well. So only a couple of times. And um, which is more than me. Well, it, well, <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's it's way harder than it seems because, especially if you're uh, snorkeling, if you're scuba diving, you are uh, completely underwater and there are no waves uh, throwing you around. So that's a definitely a big advantage uh, right there and. Uh, and I find that if you just keep very compact and take your arms in, kind of tuck your elbows in, you have, you have your page right here. So it, you move around with it so you don't, it doesn't uh, jiggle uh, as much if you have uh, uh, your arms uh, extended out. So that definitely helps. But as I was saying, I don't have much experience as well in that area. So. I still have to try out the paper that you sent me, but I find that also the plate uh, is working very well with just a graphite pencil. And then afterwards, I do a squid, quick, squid, uh, quick sketch on the plate. And then afterwards, I redraw it in my nature. So when you say the plate, um, what, what do you mean by yeah. the plate? One minute. Just okay. a second. So that's an interesting idea that he has about just sort of the, how the motion of the waves and things is going to be affecting you. And as a snorkeler near the surface, I think that that's going to be, that's going to be interesting. Um, tucking those elbows in, make yourself compact. Um, you'll be less pushed around by the water. And he was also talking about using a tank so that you can go deeper and have less of that um, wave action, tuck in elbows, um, compact. I'm making a little doodle of vaulters underwater here with the elbows tucked in. There. Um, and uh, so uh, other materials that I've heard people using um, are sheets of drafting film, plasticized drafting film like Durling. 
Um, you can draw on that with pencils. You can draw on that with pens. I think underwater probably uh, pencils. Um, the um, and the ah, uh, I think we're gonna get to see the plate. It's uh well we moved around, so we had to move to another apartment, and unfortunately I don't know where is it, but it's uh it's sort of a it's nothing too complicated. It's you can find it in uh well it's it is in specialized stores, but it's this white uh square uh white square um not so. Uh, it's made out of, it's made out of plastic so and uh, it has a little more um, how do you say it's not so slippery the surface is not uh, the slippery kind it's, it's a little bit it has textured. a little crumble to it yeah yeah it has a little crumble to it and there's a graphite pencil attached to it so it uh, by a string so it doesn't float away while, while you're underwater well, and that, that's uh, an interesting thought so normally if, so here if you let go of your pencil while you're there it's heading up to the surface yeah so so it has a little uh it's a uh, a little pencil attached by a string and it also has a clip on so uh when you have your scuba gear on there's usually places where you can clip things uh on like for safety and whistles and stuff so in one of those places you can just clip on uh your little uh, plate it's probably it's called a drawing pad so but unfortunately i cannot find it because we moved around and i don't know where did i pack it but i can quickly show what was my first um so these are actually very interesting i was that uh, snorkeling and i was i saw these like um jellyfish type of creatures moving around and um, they're completely transparent. So on the little drawing pad, I just sketched its form and I not noted down where it was a little, it looked like a sting, a little stinger. So um, I noted that down and I also wrote, how does it move in the water? And later- Ooh, that, have, that little, um one in motion there that little sketch is so cool i love how you used that um that arrow also to show the the, the the motion in it and that little sinuosity folks check up so do you i guess you drew that first line through and then drawing this the extra little three-dimensional bits you really kind of get the sense of that thing slicing through the water that's cool yes yeah, so you it's a, it's much easier when you have a reference so I already had the reference from sketch underwater it's just that don't expect to uh it's very hard while you're floating there to get all the information and be very detailed about the subject so you you're getting cold the waves are throwing you around there's a lot of more interesting things swimming around so uh don't get distracted definitely by detail. Just jot down quickly while what you see, take some notes and move on and later uh, fill that into your journal. So that would be my top tip. I haven't yet tried it with scuba, uh, with the scuba equipment, but I guess it could be a little bit easier. Of course, there's also currents and uh, when you're with a scuba gear, there's a lot more things that you need to take um, in account. So you have to regulate if you're not going up and you're breathing and all sort of more stuff uh, comes uh, that you need, that your brain gets distracted by. But uh, um, I think it could be in a way easier uh, than those waves throwing you, throwing you around. So. All right, that's, that's really useful. Um, um, Walters, thank you so much for that. Um, the, so you've got a, a little a plastic pad that you can clear and, and wipe. You've got your pencil attached on a little string. 
Um, I am reminded of uh, Cornish artist Tony Foster, um, who also has done a bunch of drawing underwater. Let me share some of his stuff. Uh, so he's a watercolor artist, <clears throat> but he doesn't bring his watercolor paints down there. Um, I think he use, uses oil-based uh, crayon pencils. Um, and then he's drawing those drawings on sheets of drafting film. Did you get a chance to try any of the drafting film sheets? No, not yet. I haven't been, I haven't gone oh. diving uh, now, but uh, we'll okay. soon. I stayed for longer here, so okay, uh, good, probably good. will. All right. Um, let me um, sort of do a screen share of some of this Tony Foster um, shenanigan. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this, hold on a second here. Um, this, this, this character who you're seeing here, um, uh, hanging out underwater, that's, that's Tony Foster. And, um, he is, um, his system, um, he also has, he's got a, a plastic drawing board. He's also using scuba gear like you do. Um, and so he's, he's drawing with these sort of oil-based pencils on drafting film on this sheet that he's got clipped to his board. I think that one of the dangers of doing this is it's possible when you're um, sketching to get into such a flow state that you won't be kind of minding your, your oxygen level. So it's good to have a buddy uh, with you if you do this so you don't stay down too long. Um, and what he does is he, he'll do these preliminary sketches on here and then turns them into when he gets uh, topside he turns those into, um, into a watercolor drawing. Um, so this is, let's see if we can view this image. Um, so up above here, so this is a watercolor sketch he's done based on um, these drawings that he's done underwater. This thing down below, this is the drafting film sheet you can see that his clips kind of rusted a little bit. So there's kind of rust stains on that. This was, this is something that he sketched underwater. That's bananas, right? And so you can see written notes on there. He's able to apply some color. He's thinking about um, the, you know, how the light is coming through on these coral reefs and then applying that to yeah the, the color it's uh i don't know with what kind of pencils could you do it definitely not on the little drawing plastic drawing pad that's i don't think that would be possible there but maybe on the paper that you sent me what, what was what was it called Dra drafting uh, film the, yeah the drafting film the duraline drafting film um, i'll shoot an email over to tony foster and ask him uh what pencils he was using i, mean, I know i've got it written down in one of my journals um, and you actually can see his underwater drawing kit if you go to the foster yep. museum um uh in the, the san francisco bay area here but that's a little bit hard from where you are Walter. so I'll, so we'll find out from tony what pencils he was using um well, that's I, think cool. there, I think there also was for additional information there also was a podcast on uh, journaling with nature uh, about I think it was even two episodes about uh, I don't remember the name but about a woman who was also journaling on the water so I think that could be useful I haven't listened to it myself but uh all right, we can could be some that. information there. And certainly um, Marley Pfeiffer um, gets into enough crazy bit business that I, I know, I bet he's experimented with uh, some stuff um, underwater. So the, that's, those are some fun resources. Um, Walters, thanks so much for, for sharing that with us. I will, uh, I will now try uh, to run and find the drawing pad because it could be useful to show it, but uh, okay. thank you very much. Hey, thank you. So if you do find it, just we'll, um, you're now a, a yeah. co-host, so you can unmute yourself anytime and just kind of go like, hey, I've got the pad. All right? Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. man. That's great. Um, 
So now let's talk a few other things about how things look underwater. Um, one of, there's, there's two phenomena that I wanted to, to look at. Um, and hold on, I'm going to, <clears throat> I actually did a little workshop on this back when we were back in the, back in the day when we were doing live, live things. Um, hold on a second. I'm going to go to uh, projects. I'm going to open the presentation I did because I actually created a few visuals that were useful in doing this. And projects, lectures and presentations. There it is, lectures and presentations. Um, and I think this was on drawing, it was in the context of drawing fish that this came up. Um, Oh, so that would be under drawing workshops. I go to my drawing workshops file. Sorry, everybody has to kind of watch me find those of find things. Wish I had a better organization system. Um, drawing fish and drawing fish two. Uh, open these two presentations. It's got to be in one of these. Um, so the, the, the first uh, phenomena that is really interesting to, to check out is the impact that light, uh, the water has on light. And if you've ever looked at a, at a distant sunset um, and seen the sky turning orange, what you're seeing when the sky turns orange is a, um, oh, here I go. This is what I want. Yeah, let me start with this. It's better to show you than just to tell you. Um, share screen. So, let me clear a few. Um, hide video panel and hide floating meeting controls. There we go. All right. So here's here's the the first phenomena. Um, as we look up uh, in the the in the water, looking out sort of out into water is different than looking up towards the surface. And so, as you look up towards the surface, um, you are going to see um, more and more of these spots where ripples on the surface are bending light to kind of go towards you. So, light that is going in really distant out here. Um, is being bent towards you. And that's why you're seeing these little, um, these little pale patches. Note that they're kind of lens shaped and flattened. And as you get closer towards the top of the screen, those shapes become broader and, um, and more open. So smaller, and more flattened towards the, 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 as you go into the distance, as you're going down. And, but then as you get closer and closer um, above you, you're looking up into those. So the sh those little light shapes are changing. You also have this phenomena of um, these sort of, these beams of light coming in from where the sun is. Right. Um, this is is formed by again the the water surface bouncing and making lenses that are concentrating light in some areas and removing light from others, and all of those lines will point towards where the sun is. So you will, will want to think of these lines as converging 
somewhere above the screen where the sun is. So if you're putting those sorts of elements into your picture, notice there are some places where there's dark projected down, darker, where the light has been blocked, other places where light is focused. And then as you look up, of course, you can see the places where light is coming through, and you can see where the places where light is blocked. That's kind of fun. The impact, though, of this, if you are in a shallow area, is this is the bottom of a pool, are what are called caustics. These are patterns that are made by light being focused on the bottom. So light is focused away from these areas and into these areas. You know how a magnifying glass bends light towards one point. If you have, instead of, if you have the reverse shape of a magnifying glass, it spreads light out. And so if you have a surface that's sometimes lens shaped, sometimes inverse uh, lens shaped, in some places you're going to be dispersing light, in others you are focusing light, and that's what makes these random caustic patterns on upward facing surfaces. So you're only going to see these when you're close to the surface. So if there is a whale shark or a shark swimming along, you're going to see the caustics on its upper surfaces, but not on its belly. So these are only on things that are projected down. And um, it's really uh, lovely to, to look at all these patterns. Uh, something that I like doing when my daughters are ta uh, taking their swimming lessons is I bring my little sketch pad to the pool and I draw the, I can draw the caustics on the bottom of the pool and then look as I kind of look up further away in the pool, how those fade out and sort of change. Um, as you look down, I'm looking down into the water. I'm seeing the caustics on the bottom. As I look further up, um, I get more of the, the, the blue and the reflection of whatever is, is above them. So it's a, it's a really fun thing to look for and um, is, uh, they, they just, they, they make all sorts of constantly moving. It's like these, uh, these sort of images of like neural connections constantly changing. Really, really fun. But again, you're only going to see caustics on the on surfaces that point up. So it's the back of the whale shark, not the belly of the whale shark. And you're also only going to see this when it is near the surface. For, so for deep water things, you're not going to be drawing in caustics. As you get I don't know the depth that these disappears, but it's pretty fast. Um, <clears throat> so you get down further, you are caustic free. So here it is. Check out <laughs> Carcaridon here. Bonum, bonum, and look at its back. Oh, cool. So squint at it. Look at how dark the back is. That, sh that, that tail and the dorsal fin pointing up. Um, so they're not catching that light. You can actually see some little bursts of caustics across part of the, this edge of the tail here, and then all along that back. That is so cool. That's so cool. Right? And then you're also seeing the shadow on the belly of this shark, the sun hitting the top. That's why this shark actually has a white belly. This is called counter shading. So the shark is um, coloring itself to help it camouflage itself in the water, in the open water, by having um, a lighter belly, a darker back. Here, when it's very close to the surface, can you figure out where the sun is in this picture? Um, here, where it's very close to the surface, um, we've got these bright caustics, so its form is, is even more illuminated. But if this were just a little bit deeper, you wouldn't be getting these really bright blasts on the back and the dark at the back and would really match the shadowed belly. And this would, would blend into the deep. Something that is um, fun to, to do if you ever um, have a chance to, there are some videos that are taken by people in shark cages um, who go out and, 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 and film great white sharks. But notice when the sharks are far away, 
just how difficult they are able it is to be able to see them because of this pattern. There you've got some really nice caustics. All right, so here we have a water column and up near the top, right? Um, here we are up near the top and um, at about 10 meters, 20 meters, 35 meters, 45 meters, and 100 meters down into the deep. And um, what we've got here are the, is how far certain colors will penetrate down into the depths. So the red wavelengths of light only go down about 10 meters. And orange here drops out at 20 meters. So that means if you're looking at a, at a fish that is red and orange at about 21 meters down, it looks like a gray fish. So you would not be seeing these colors in that deep fish. And then as you go towards the surface, so you'd still see the yellow in it. You'd see yellows and greens and the, all the other colors in it, but you, but you wouldn't see any reds and oranges. So as you go, as you drop down into the water, you go further and further and further, you're not going to see all the colors in the spectrum. So that picture that Tony Foster did, he was uh, in this sort of 10 meter zone. So he's uh, in a coral reef, which is close to the surface because the coral has live photosynthesizing cells in it. They get too deep. They're not getting their big smorgasbord of sunlight. So he was up here at the surface and that's why you're seeing red fish. But if you go down, just a little bit deeper, you don't see any red fish, even though you're seeing some fish that are red, you just won't be able to see the colors on them. So as you go down deep, you're gonna find that a lot of deep sea critters are red. Why would you be red? Well, it's because red doesn't show up deep down. So it's a great way. So at, at, at the surface, you're gonna find lots of counter shading, you know, fish with counter shading saying, look, hey, my back is gonna get the, the light on it. My belly is going to be in shadow. So I'm here where the sunlight is coming through and um, you're going to, I'm, so I'm a counter shaded fish there. A deep sea fish is not counter shaded because there is no light coming down on the belly. And then also you'll see a whole bunch of deep sea organisms are red because then they can be kind of just hanging out anywhere down here where the red has dropped out and their colors are blending in. Isn't that fun? All right, and then I'm gonna stop there. Um, so those are um, just a few thoughts um, about how colors change as you go down. Oh, Walters, were you able to find the, your, your little clipboard? Oh, thumbs down, sorry. Um, some other time. Um, but so if you are drawing a deep sea critter and you draw it red, then what you're doing is you're drawing a deep, a deep sea critter <clears throat> under um, the illumination of natural light, which is is kind of I mean it's interesting that it's it's red, but that's just not how it how it how it appears down there. Um, actually, I've got this really great photograph of a um, here's a really great photograph of of a deep sea fish um, taken at depth. All right, isn't that great? There it is. Yeah, that's how they look when they're that, they're down that far. So it's 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 all black, and it, it really blends in with its environment pretty well. That's what I'm thinking. Um, the um, so let, let's see. Uh, yeah, somebody uh, said like, you know, what's up with the lobster being red? 
Well, have you ever actually looked at lobsters pre-cooking? They're not red. A lot of the lobster red is the impact of being thrown in a pot of boiling water. Um, and it changes their color. There are some lobsters that are red though. Um, and, that, and those blend in really, really well down there because they're below that uh, where you get those colors. But um, also a lot of the bright red lobster is, is a phenomenon of, I think of the cooking process. So I've been told. Um, now I am, yeah, uh, red is the new black. Um, I want to see, oh, uh, uh, Lynn, Lynn, uh, Lynn is saying, uh, Karen Dosh medium water soluble pencils. Well, actually, I, um, I don't know if what you want to bring underwater, I don't think you want to bring your water soluble pencils down there. Because um, I think that you'd end up with kind of a gummy mass. Um, but um, let's, can I bring in um, Lynn? Uh, Lynn, if you're here, raise your hand uh, using the raise hand function and see if we, you have some um, thoughts on those water soluble. Pencil. Ah, there's Lynn. Um, Lynn. Um, um, have you tried some of these under underwater? Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can. Okay. We hear you loud and clear. I just went out and found Tony Foster's video, and he says he uses that. I wasn't oh. from, probably typed the name wrong. Karen Dosh water soluble pencil. Okay. A little further up, he said he had to use a medium one. So if it if you don't use water soluble, he says it doesn't make any marks on the water. So oh, a couple. Oh, right. So I guess we do want them then to be a little bit softer. That's great to know. Um, Lynn, thank you for, for checking out. We, we've got a, a whole team here of, of folks <laughs> kind of uh, checking into these things for us. So, so Tony Foster says he's using Karin Dosh medium water soluble pencils to do those things, those drawings on drafting film. Yeah. That, and he was showing the picture that you you show, and I put the link in there if people want to go over and watch it. Oh, oh, thank you, thank yeah, you. So, a for excellent. Um, a, a, another um, um, fun thing. I think that he also he puts he solves his the the problem of his pencils floating away by putting weights on his pencils. So he um, I think put a bunch of kind of taped a bunch of washers to the top of his pencils. Uh, and so they, they wouldn't, when he would be down there on the, 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 uh, on the, the bottom of the, the, the sort of shallow reef there, he wouldn't have his pencils kind of going up to the surface. Um, he also, at one point, I think he told me about that uh, some of the fish were really interested in his brightly colored pencils. And the fish would kind of come in and inspect his pencils as he was, as he was sketching there. That would be kind of fun. Um, Lynn, thank you so much for checking that out for us. Um, let's see. Um, the um, I'm going to bring uh, Walters back in. Yeah, I I just wanted to add the adding weights would be fine, but also you need to make sure that they just don't float away. Uh, so attach them to you because there are all kinds of things you have to take into account, uh, including currents. So, and about the fish, um, a little tip if you want to attract some, it doesn't work while snorkeling very well, but while scuba diving, you can either uh, take a small rock and rub it against another rock, or some fish really like if you are on the bottom. Um, well, I don't recommend particularly maybe doing that, but if it's a full sandy bottom, then maybe just pick a bit of sand up and throw it because the fish will be an interest that maybe something bigger is feeding there and they will come to pick up the scraps. So, so you're, um, just, you're, you're just lifting some sand. So you just water. take a bit of sand and 
yeah throat so it makes a little uh cloud so it uh, attracts uh, the fish oh that's really neat so yeah and- but it but of course it's the best to observe them just uh, uh from a distance and uh naturally so yeah, and you you're talking about kind of rubbing rocks together and people are like well that doesn't make any sense but actually sound travels really really well underwater and if you if you get down and you listen underwater there's all sorts of Mm -hmm. sort of clicks and things fish are constantly making tons of vocalizations we think of birds singing all the time um but uh the uh we think of birds singing all the time and fish are constantly chattering um, and also things like parrot fish, what, as they're kind of chomping away, uh, if you're at, 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 a, at a reef, you can hear the fish just kind of nom, nom, nom yep. on, the, on the, the, the reef and things. We also think of like the behaviors that fish do. We think of fish as they kind of float and maybe they eat something. But fish are doing I mean, like you, you, you think, think, think of fish like birds, right? Birds are constantly displaying to each other. They've got territories and the fish are doing all these same things. The fish are doing all these same things. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the fish will be uh, displaying with their fins. So um, how wide the fins are, how the fish turns its body relative to other things. So if you want to be really impressive, you turn your body sideways to somebody else and then you flare your fins out like, look, I'm really big. And um, so, and, and then they'll, they'll, they chase each other out of territories. You'll see birds chase each other out of territories. You'll see fish also patrolling these territories. But we, but we because we're so land centric, we don't think of fish as having these interesting ideas. You kind of swim around and go like, oh, look, there's a fish. And then we swim towards the fish and then the fish swims away. And so we go like, you know, fish, they just kind of swim around. But you were talking about observing them from a distance, right? <clears throat> so you're, you, you're, you're kind of, if you're close enough that you're changing the behavior of the fish, you're not going to see these really cool things. So have you um, sort of, hanging back at a distance and observing fish have you been able to 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 watch fish behaviors and interactions mm-hmm. well i uh i do remember a couple of uh times i wasn't uh back then i was pretty uh small and uh, but um i was a couple of years ago i was in uh, seychelles those are islands north uh, so northeast of madagascar and um we were uh, snorkeling over there and there were these uh, i think those were uh, white tip sharks i'm not sure if they, that's what they were called yeah but white tip sharks it was very interesting to observe how um, they were almost like hunting in little packs uh, together so they were going really close to the bottom and just searching these little crevices uh, together and uh, patrolling the uh, bottom. So that was uh, very interesting to see uh, over there. So, so it's it's a very diverse world, and uh, we really don't know much about it. So it's cool to uh, observe it. That, that's, that's birds great. are we, and exactly like you said, the birds. We can observe them, and we have uh, we have uh, optics, we have binoculars and telescopes. So also, if even if a bird is far away, we can take our binoculars and go like, "Oh, the bird is sitting there and singing." Uh, it's not flying away, but if you swim swim to a fish, it's of, of course it's going to take off. But um, if you just be there and uh, don't flap your fins around uh, and uh, it's also very important to be very compact while you're underwater. So I'm I am still learning this, but uh, my dad is a very good diver, and uh, we were diving once, and he said that I was uh, just a bit too busy with my arms 
uh, going around and spinning around. So it's fun. But uh, if you want to respect the world, the underwater world, you have to keep your arms close and just do like small movements. Don't go crazy there under. So uh, that also helps uh, uh, is a bit more makes the fish get used to you uh, faster. So. So yeah, so just just like you're when you're watching birds, if we walk too close to the bird, we scare, we flesh the bird, and so we. <clears throat> one of the things which we learn from experience is kind of what is the flushing distance and what is the behavior of the bird as it starts to get nervous about us. We see, you know, even pick its head up. Then a lot of us know, okay, I'm going to back up a little bit, and then um, we can watch the bird's behaviors and we get to watch the bird doing bird things. The same is true of fish. Fish are absolutely fascinating to watch the behaviors they have. If you, even if you have a little fish tank, you'll see them start to develop some of these behaviors inside those tanks. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yep. don't them as just like, I'm a little dude floating around, but they've got a zone, they've got attitudes, they've got territories. There's, there's really lots of fun stuff to do. You also mentioned kind of this incredible diverse world. I think that this, this is, you know, it bears mentioning um, in this conversation that the most diverse systems in the ocean, the, uh, the coral reef systems right now are experiencing an incredible, an incredible threat. Um, we've got the, the warmest ocean temperatures that we've, uh, that we know of and uh, there's this phenomenon going on called uh, coral reef bleaching, which is where your ocean temperatures um, uh, rise, and the um, the in in response to that, the corals um, they, they they first will change colors in response to the shock, and then they're bleached and they're dead. Um, we had. Uh, on the Great Barrier Reef system, um, the northern parts of the reef systems were the first ones to be hit because you know they're closer to the equator. Um, and then over the last few years, the, the 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 central parts of the reef, just a little bit further south of that, the bleaching really hit there. And this year, now we've got the southern parts of the reef. Uh, massively bleaching. So, and this is the same thing is true all in, in reef systems all over the globe. Um, it is something for us as people are concerned about nature um, to really, this is happening on our watch. And um, the, the coral reefs are sort of the, the, the tropical rainforests of the ocean. Um, if you ever, if you get a chance to see these things, um, you will be inspired to protect them. If you do want to see them, I suggest that you see them soon. Um, because if our society is not going to pro take really proactive steps to do something about the temperature, um, we're going to perhaps, um, the coral reef systems that we know are going to be part of history. Um, there's a, a, a documentary called, I think, Chasing Coral, um, that is worth people's time. Um, the, um, I'd love to, to bring on um, uh, Susan Becker. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about fish watching um, in um, where we don't have to go to a coral reef, but where we can actually see fish behaviors um, where you are. Hey there. Um, hey. Yeah, I can't, can't say that I've, that I've done very much of it, but um, yeah, uh, you know, lots and lots of ponds here, lots of vernal ponds that don't have fish, I learned, but also lots and lots of excellent ponds and things. Um, uh, a lot of them, there's been some discussion in the, in the comments about, um, you know, why there seem to be so many, uh, so, so many, so, so clear tropical waters and so murky warm waters, I don't know, but I will say that in, the, in a lot of sort of shallow ponds and waterways and things, or at least ones where there's a shallow enough shore, in the summer you can see little, little, little sunfish, which I think are related to, to bass, I think there's a few different species, but it's a whole family there. Um, and you can see these little 
these little shallow circular depressions in the water, just a few inches below the water, right near the shore. And a little sunfish will be hanging out in there. And um, if anything drops into that area, they'll go and they'll clear it out. And if any other fish comes by, they say, I've only really ever seen them chase other fish out. So I'm, I'm pretty sure those are, those are other males that they're chasing out of that territory. And then, and then I think at least what I've been told is that they are, um, you know, these are males that are sort of making this little display ground and then, you know, to show off the females. I, I can't say that I've, that I've seen <laughs> very, very much of it, but I've been keen to, to uh, watch more and see what they're doing. But yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, everywhere you go, they're, they're doing something interesting. <laughs> yeah. And I think just, just thinking of fish, I was realizing that, that fish are exhibiting these really, really complex behaviors, um, including <laughs> vocalizing um, displays, territories, chasing each other. Um, when we know this, <laughs> um, the, uh, it, it, it motivates us to take a closer look. And um, so I do want to, um, as we kind of get into spring here in the Northern Hemisphere uh, and in the summer, uh, that is, um, this, this would be kind of a fun thing to look at. So when you get a chance to see fish, Sometimes like if we're not really paying attention and we kind of klutz our way along the creek and we kind of like, oh, there was a fish. Um, that's like kind of walking through the bushes like, oh, there was a bird. Um, but if, but do some sneaking and do some sneaking and see if you can watch some fish. Um, anybody who is a snorkeler, anybody who is a scuba -er, uh, we encourage you to do that and share your sketches, your observations um, with us. Um, Perhaps we should do a little workshop on drawing fish. That could be that could be a lot of fun. Um, yep. Um, and also, uh, E's pointing out um, that there's lots of people who study, you know, uh, mammals, birds. Lots of people studying birds. Um, the people we need more people who are studying things like reef systems. People who are going to be studying. Um, fish behavior and interactions. The more that we can kind of get people on board doing that, um, we might be able to get information that can help us protect and preserve these systems. Um, so um, I hope you got some useful ideas here. Um, there wasn't so much a, a class today about, um, you know, here's how you draw a fish, um, but we had a, some interesting thoughts about um, how things look underwater. And um, if you are drawing an underwater scene, uh, what, what you can be showing or not showing. And I hope that that was fun. I hope that that was, was um, useful. Actually, you know, I, I think we need to get, um, I think we should do uh, a program about coral reefs. Um, if anybody's in touch with any coral reef researchers um, or people who are principals at coral reef conservation uh, organizations, would you please shoot me an email with their contact information? Um, and Susan, thank you for encouraging us to check out our local little fish. <laughs> um, so let's let's um, open this up now to uh, some sharing and conversation. I I wanted to quickly add, uh, I just posted a little link in the chat. It was a beautiful little video you said how about uh, fish underwater sounds. It's not very, it's maybe not about fish, it's about uh, whales, but a very, a short little inspiring video I recommend to watch. Oh, I will check that out. Um... It's about uh, it's about uh, underwater photography, uh, but um, it was some beautiful scenes. So, oh, I, I will look forward to, to to checking that out. The um, I remember when I was a little kid. We remember when we actually when we had records. We had records and record players, and you know there'd be this thing that would go around in circles and put the needle down on it. And uh, our family, my grandparents gave us a sub subscription to National Geographic. And um, at one point in National Geographic came this little plastic sheet you could put down on top of your record player. You put the needle on it 
And it was the first time any of us had heard humpback whale vocalizations. They sent out a record, a little plastic record with humpback whale vocalizations. Because back then, you know, nobody, nobody could, there's no other way of kind of dispensing that. You can kind of make a YouTube video, like listen to the humpback whales. Um, but I remember that just as we, we played that record until it wore out. It was, it was really fun. It was really, really fun. The, um, um, so let's bring in, um, if anybody has cool pages that they want to share. Um, do you have anything today, Valters? Um, Not to put you on the spot, oh, or anything, but I know one, you're on the spot. One quick thing I, um, I put in graphs and charts and I wanted to share one thing there was this um, canarian chiff chaff it's a it's a warbler type of bird um was building a nest in a tree and uh, for the first time I was trying a little uh chart to do a little chart about its productivity whilst uh building the nest so I, this is the little, um, this is the little chiff chaff and it was building the nest in this tree. And I put, I was um, sitting there and I put, we'll see you seven on minutes. The side. yeah, yeah, yep. And I will, I put on the timer seven minutes and these are the times of how many in that minute he came to the nest and put something in it, a stick or a little piece of wool to see how fast was it building it. And um, so in the fir first minute example, it four times he dropped something in the second, three times, then one time, then three again, then one, three, and so, so two four times. So times, four times within that minute or four times within a seven minute period? No, this was so the first in the first minute during yes, the first yes. minute. This is four a super times. active little chip chaff. It, during uh, the second minute, only the one minute period. So not during those two whole minutes, but during only the second minute. Yeah, yeah. Three times. So I love this and, way uh, of visualizing it, and also a nice gecko action going on. Ah, um, uh, yeah. But finally um, found some. That's really cool. Oh, look at the close up of the toes. Yep, that's how we stick to things. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's hold that up one more time. I love the little um, good idea of putting that shadow in, um, really kind of pops that gecko off your page. Um, folks, um, notice how not just looking for numbers, but finding a way to visualize the numbers on this page. Ooh, um, that is that is really really that's really really cool. Uh, Thank you. I want to encourage people to uh, to to try to do that themselves. Um, um, if you can quantify things and visualize that, um, that's that's a really good exercise. And then for it to be a little more data, I did the second time I visited, I also did this little chart. But in the fourth minute, it, uh, he got uh, kind of lazy. So, uh, <laughs> and in these minutes, he was just taking one piece of little white plastic and he put it in a spot but he didn't like it so he took it out dropped it on the ground the next minute he came back for it again put it in the nest no that's not the spot moved it around so he was just uh keeping himself busy uh with a little piece that's of plastic cool. so oh that's yeah. neat so again um, I'm really liking this, um, this quantification. So the numbers are just another language for investigating things. And when you are 
when you're counting things, measuring things, timing things, your brain thinks in a way that is different than when you're making sketches or writing observations. And so if we're deliberate yep. about looking for ways of doing that, we're going to improve the way we think. We improve the way we yep. think. Love it. And uh, thank you very much. Also, I watched the shoreboard, shoreboard class that was not on the 28th. I could not make it, but uh, an older one. And because I was really confused on how to color those uh, where. Um, way their uh, backs because they're just so yeah. complicated well, like so, those crazy and then, piles of scapular feathers yeah and... so it's very hard you, you just get lost in the details so you had the technique where you go uh where you go in this direction a couple of bumps in this direction and then another direction for the third layer and then it looks uh somewhat close to how it should so like that oh oh this is fun it really really helped so not just looking where every spot should be just getting the uh jizz of the bird down so yeah that really kind of and 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 this is also very uh, uh john busby would approve of these uh sketches here right <laughs> You're really kind of getting the sense of that live bird. Um, by the way, folks, um, next month, at the start of next month, Walters and I are going to be uh, doing a workshop together on our favorite bird artist, uh, John Busby. And so we'll be analyzing those pictures um, and sharing them with you as something that's really inspired and motivated us in our drawing and journaling. And um, I think you'll you'll enjoy that. So I'm looking forward to doing that with you, uh, Walters. That'll be fun. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, so I see uh, Kate's got something to share. Um, Guile and Jack um, and Avea. Did you uh, have something you wanted to share also today? All right, um, Avea and Ray Bonto. Um, so uh, let's see. I've got. I'm going to bring on. I'll just kind of go in, in, in order of little clicks here. Um, Kate, good to see you. Um, you can now unmute. Oh, I thank you. Well, it's been a while since we've gone through my sketchbook, so there's been some exciting updates. Since it's finally warm, um, I've decided to really work on doing field sketching. Oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, and you guys will love this. This is what we came up with, or we're talking about recently. Um, I went to the Marine Life Center. You can't see it very well. Let's see if I can adjust my lighting. To, there we go, maybe. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, yes, so yes, I was at the yes. Marine Life Center down in Bellingham. There's a spot by the harbor where they have a bunch of tanks and um, it's a good little education center. And I just sat there trying to draw the rockfish and trying to figure out how to capture their pose which was really hard um so looking at down at them from above and so I tried to do what Ray Bonto does with his birds and just do a page where you just every time you see a detail or a prominent line you just do that and then kind of keep moving on as things move that's that such piece. a good strategy instead of just getting tunnel vision um on yeah. how to finish this 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 one little drawing so you get you bring, you're, you're invoking your Bonto there that's great uh, yeah invoking my Bonto <laughs> Yeah, so then what I did was uh, I had one little sketch that I liked when I got home, so I took my gouache paint and um, I used that to make this composition with the leather stars and some sort of little uh, bass thing, I think. Um, oh, that's fun. That, that angle, yeah. of the, the fish, is that it's really challenging to, to, to do those. Again, it's a three-quarter view. Um, that's really, really fun to see. I like the how you're kind of keeping elements like the, the eyes, nose, the face that you're, you're, we're using parallel guides to kind of keep the parts of yes, the fish yeah. symmetrical one side to the other. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, fish, they're so noticeably symmetrical that if you get too far off from that, that's gonna really uh, be noticeable. But anyways, it's more where I did little sketches in the field of some vertebrates, uh, 
the little grunt sculpin inside its barnacle. And then like for these ones, I came back later with the gouache. Um, I was gonna stay and try and do some painting there, but um, I went and then they said uh, 15 minutes and then we're closing for a staff meeting. I'm like, really? One day I make it down here. But anyways, oh. I took some of the sketches and I took the gouache to them later. And like, there's the anemones and the little touch tank type thing. The oh. do not touch tank actually. The do um, <laughs> yeah. It's set up like a touch tank, except for the sign that says do not touch. It's kind of funny. And there's a little grunt sculpin, which is a little tiny fish. It's a very, cute. yeah, it's inside of a large hollowed out barnacle, which is pretty fun. Here's the notes from drawing seabirds. Uh, oh, fun. Really fun. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I did a curlew to post with the hashtag. And, um, then these are sketches from the dog park. I sat down and <laughs> I told my mom I would do a portrait of her dog for um, for Mother's Day. So I actually finished that. I'll show you in a minute. Um, but to practice for that, I went and I just drew people's dogs. That's smart. And That's smart. Yeah. Yeah, they don't cooperate. No, they don't. That was the point. Like, they'll come up. They want to see you. Then they run off. I was also lucky because there's a heron rookery right around the corner from the dog park. Um, so they're all up in their nests right now. Um, and there's a little lagoon that has some ducks. And so these are all field sketches here. I'm slowly trying to get good at those. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. like your line variation, how you're, um, uh, there's you know, some places you're kind of punching in a, a heavier line, defining that form, other places letting it be soft. And then where you don't have data, you're, 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 you're willing to stop that sketch. Yeah, yeah. Actually, not all these are field sketches. I threw in some shorebird practice at the bottom. Um, so I did a little more shorebird practice after that class. Um, and then I did a little exercise where I didn't do, use pencil at all. I just used like a plain dollar store uh, gel pen and really worked on line variation with that because you can get very light lines with that and you can punch them in. And so I figured that'd be really? kind of a, yeah. Okay. And I actually really, Show, show, us, show us the pen. Um, that's that's interesting. So it's a, a um, pen, kind of a dollar store pen. I, you can get a lot of line variation. Yeah, it's like your basic ballpoint pen. I have a dozen of them lying around somewhere. I mean, I'm sure everyone has seen one of these. This is one of my favorite tools to bring out in the field because you can paint watercolor over it. You can basically use it yeah. to sketch with. They're indestructible. They're dirt cheap. Um, yeah. It's kind of funny because sometimes it's like for a few things, like for watercolors, the pigment, the uh, paper, a really good brush can make a huge difference. And then, you know, I have a $30 brush that I use. And then one of my other favorite things is this pencil that- <laughs> The big round Not stick. pencil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got a little yeah. bit more. Um, so then I took that same pen, which started dying out to the barn with me and everything but the seabird uh was drawn from life um so i started drawing the horses out in the field because they're on pasture and that was going great until they decided to come over and sit with me you get the close up. made it a lot harder yeah. yeah but i tried to take advantage of that and more ray bonto-esque stuff like they were standing there right oh, in front yeah. of me and all i could see so i tried to draw like their legs and the um the poses while they graze um yeah, and I played with yeah. gouache a little bit Those more. The negative shapes underneath the legs and underneath the neck when they're feeding, I find so helpful in those. Yeah, that was game changing because before I always try and just draw the neck instead of drawing that negative shape, and it would never look right. Yeah, these these negative shapes, those. Yeah, solid. it's game changing. So then I've been playing with gouache a lot because I had some leftover for some art classes that I was taking. Um, and for this paper, I was wondering why I wasn't getting the performance I liked with the watercolor. And uh, it's not watercolor paper, so yeah. it kind of checks but, but, out. Uh, actually, go back. Just I, I love what's kind of going on here with the water. So there's a light green, then with a darker green coming in on it. Then there's another fade to a medium green. So mm -hmm. those are going on. And look at how the 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 it, it's one color is fading into the other. It's in little kind of horizontal strips. So it's not a blend. It's yeah. you get the sense of ripples on the water from that. And then 
you, you put in a few little highlights and stopped. That's the yes. hardest thing to do, right? You put, you put in some of those highlights and you go like, wow, the water's really glistening and kind of looking watery. Mm -hmm. And then you keep going. And then you keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's just some bird sketches from bird pixel. Uh, and then I was doing some studies. The mom said, I want my little dog with California poppy. So I started doing some studies. <laughs> uh, did some poppies. I did a painting. I would grab that one for you, but uh, it's in my sister's room. And then more poppies just for study for going draw flowers. These are field sketches. My friend who is a 13 year old boy has ducks and geese. And so I sat with him in his yard and drew ducks and geese with him. Um, so that was actually great practice because normally when you're drawing or normally when I draw waterfowl, they're wild birds. And um, these ones were either within close range or being held in a child's lap as I drew them. Oh. Yeah, which was great. Uh, so we're doing more of the nature journal stuff, like observing the waterfowl up close and we're really scared of people. There's also a pond uh, where we were and we're looking for frogs because I was hoping to draw some frogs. We found a leech instead, luckily not on anybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, dog studies, and that's it for this one. So the April notebook is almost dead. Which... Oh, man, April notebook has, has gotten really some good miles in it. That's fantastic. It really has. And then for May, uh, I'm just barely starting the test page. This is going to go on a road trip with me uh, from San Diego to South Carolina. So I'm going to really push to do the field sketch and stuff. Right, yeah, so but hey, I think you're going to fill that book in the first uh, week of your road trip. We'll see. It's pretty thick. But it oh, is okay. watercolor paper. I was just thinking that, actually. I was thinking, okay, do I need to go buy another one? The only thing is that I'm going to be with someone who isn't going to be sitting there drawing. So I think mm -hmm. I'm going to like sit there and sketch. And then while we're in the car and she's driving, then I can fill in some details. Um, oh yeah, uh, you can also do a bunch. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree with Avea to bring another one just in case. Um, but yeah, you can also I work think... on some passenger seat sketches. Um, so yeah, sketches of the landscape or sort of weird signs of the place, um, uh, as seen from the passenger seat. You can even have when you yeah. you stick your feet up on the dashboard, you can stick them into. It. <laughs> yep. Anyways, so the other thing I discovered was Arches watercolor paper. Thank you, Susan. Uh, you have spoiled me for life. I cannot go back now. Anyways, I was looking at my watercolors, wondering why I wasn't getting the performance I wanted. And um, the workability that you get from using the whole cotton rag. <laughs> oh, no. You know, I mean, even this, like, that's my first attempt painting with that stuff. Yeah. And, um, oh, yeah, cabbage white that I see, Susan. Um, uh yeah, so great. great Mother's Day present, but I'm really excited to start working with watercolor and have the ability to work and layer it more than some of the paper I've been using before has allowed me to. So that's gonna really make Mama happy. It has. She's she loves her little dog and my artwork, but I think she loves her little dog more. <laughs> uh, oh, Kate, thank you so much for that share. That's really oh, thanks cool. for having me. Yeah, and thank you to Ray Bonto for the inspiration to start drawing like that. Because I think for this nicer sketchbook where I normally wouldn't do the um, the field sketches, I think that's what's going to really push me to be able to fill up those pages. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. Love it. Um, thank you, Kate. Um, that's, that's, I'm really inspired and also love to see the way that you are kind of taking other people's ideas and incorporating that into what you, you do kind of really sharing, uh, those, those thoughts and ideas. So, uh, next we're going to, uh, bop down to Argentina and, uh, visit our friend Kyle. Um, we are then going to go back up to the San Francisco Bay area and check in with the Bay. Um, and then Jack's up after next, uh, after that. So. I'm going to spotlight um, Gal. 
Good to see you. Oh, wait, hold on a second. We need to, um, for some reason, I can't find your ask to unmute button until I put myself back in. There we go. Hello. Hey, good to see you guys. Good to see you too and everyone. Well, today I'm here because uh, in Bariloche, where I live, it's a holiday because today is Bariloche's um, birthday. So, oh, happy birthday, Bariloches. Um, well, I don't have much in my sketchbook now because I've been very, very, very busy. But um, in the weekend, I went to uh, bird watch with a group of persons, uh, not of other people, and well. I didn't have time to sketch there because there were other people. So um, I took some pictures and when I, if I, I will draw them. And well, today uh, happened something that was great that, well, for me, it was great. For the poor bird, it wasn't. Um, I was studying for a test that I have uh, of geography. And, well, my, we hear a boom. Um, uh oh, a window uh, strike. Yes. Uh, this tiny, this. Uh, do you see the bird? I do see the bird. Oh. Oh, well, yes. Uh, I've been a while and well it flew so everything's okay <laughs> um but i took no some pictures with my with my photo camera and well later i will sketch it so okay so you're going to do some sketching for, um did, did the bird uh recover from the window strike yes oh that's great the name of the name of the bird, I know it in Spanish, but in English I have it somewhere. So if you wait a minute, I'll go find it. It's okay. In That's cool. So yeah, protecting our, our if there's, um, if you have a window, a window at your place that is re getting regular window strikes, one way of handling that is just to put a few strings kind of hanging down in front of the, the window, sort of spaced about yay far apart. Um, and you can still see out perfectly well, but the birds will see those strings and go like, oh, there's an obstacle there. Um, the, uh, what is the bird's name in Espanol? In Spanish, its name is Cabecita Negra Austral. The, the head is black, and there's a species more in the north of Argentina that isn't here. So uh, that one is Cabecita Negra, Común, and the one that we have here, that we live, we live. more in the south is Cabecita Negra Austral. Austral means close to La Cordillera, La Cordillera, yes. So I think it was something like that. I'm not sure. Oh, that's cool. And Ah, the name in English is Black Chinned Siskin. It's weird. But. Black Chinned Siskin. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with, we have Siskin, Siskins up here, Pine Siskins. Um, and I've never seen the Black Chinned Siskin. That's, that's great. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the sketches and drawings you do of it. Okay. I will do it. Great. Um, excellent. Excellent. Um, um, next, I, I would like to, uh, did, did you have, so was, it, uh, Gail, was there anything else that you wanted to share? No, no, not much. All right. Well, thank you so much for that and the story. I'm glad that you were there taking care of our little bird friend. Um, 
that's thank you so much for being a steward of that little bird. Um, now let's let's bring in the mad botanist and find out what's going on, what's cooking in your journal. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll try to I'll try to be fast because I see a lot of people want to go today. But we've, um, we've got time. Okay, first of all, um, Earth Day journal, or at least part two of the Earth Day journal. Um, on actual Earth Day, I was meaning to do some cleaning up of my site. Um, but I had to actually work. So I spent a while trying to pull up the hemlock, which was fighting me, um, the thistle, um, Italian thistle, which was about shoulder height and um, lots and lots of radishes. So these two came out easily. This one snaps off. So if anybody happens to live locally and has an extra weed wrench that they never use, I'd like to borrow it from you for like the entire season. Also, I drew this plant. I was trying to figure out a good way to draw these in the field because trying to draw multipinately compound leaves with all of their extra everything is ridiculously challenging. So I figured something out, I'm so happy. Um, what I do is I draw the structure of the leaf like this and I draw um, sort of, I block in where the, the central the, um, spine I guess would be on the leaves. And then I only fill in one of the leaflets or two. Oh, like this. that makes sense. So you're you're using you're using the kind of fractal nature or sort of repetitive repetitive structure of this to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you're, you're also... showing you're you're showing the overall. This is this is brilliant. You're showing the overall pattern of the branching, and then you're showing the details of what the little leaflets do on one half of that. And then all the rest of it is just sort of a, is, is, is filling in all those other spaces. Exactly. Ah, I like it. Thank you. I took, I took lessons from what you do when you're drawing trees, which is where you showed me a long time ago how you block in the main, like the main almost cloud-like bits of, of big masses of the tree, but then you only put a few little details just so that it will read like a eucalyptus or whichever. Mm -hmm. And so with this, I did the similar thing where I did that and then I just fill in the rest with paint. Um, even though there's only, you know, like maybe only this one is actually filled in with the pencil underneath or this one. And so by then, because you've gotten a few down, then your hand is kind of accustomed to making these motions and you can replicate that with the paint. So that's thanks to you. Oh, 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 no. Well, um, I don't think I can really take credit for that. This, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking of like, ooh, I think I'd like to try that. Um, love this innovation on drawing really complex shapes. Thank you. And then just because this plant wanted me to know how grateful it was that I was drawing it, one of its little friends tried to kill me straight, straight afterwards. Um, what was that story? So, so what happened with that was <clears throat> I'd stopped for water and I'd been moving around the site during the day. And so as a result, you know, leaves kind of get moved everywhere. And so um, I was sipping my water and noticed a weird taste in it and spat it out. And it turns out that one of the little bits of a leaflet had gotten stuck sort of between where the cap and some other things are um, of my water. And so I did not drink it. <laughs> I am glad you're paying attention. Poison hemlock, you cannot hurt our Ivea. You want but to make I was... that perfectly clear. No more hurting Ivea. That's I sort of, naughty. I sort of respect that it tried though. I mean, it's a yeah. plant that it was like, you're not pulling me out. <laughs> so. that it tried. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so then for, um, I came back the next day for Earth Day round two because I didn't pick up enough trash. Um, this was the most annoying bit of trash. Somebody clearly had some kind of celebration. I mean, that's under my eye wonders. Um, and so I mapped out where the petals were in the site that I walked um, and how many about, well, I mean, I didn't really map how many because there were like more than four dozen. Um, and so I mapped out where the biggest oh. concentration was. Um, Somebody was scattering plastic flower petals. Yeah. I mean, really, really, <laughs> really. So you could go scatter real flower petals. Yes. Oh yes, yeah, why not use real petals? Yes, I agree. Um, so I got annoyed with that. I put down where they were. Um, round two with that happened. Um, I had to draw this after I got back, but I continued um, by drawing the rest of my walk. So I, I wrote um, where I'd walked that particular day because I decided to go a little further and check out the, the habitat of the damselflies. So that's more or less sort of 
the slope I wound up walking down, although I have to add some more details. And I think that I overdid it on the rip wrap, but no big deal. Um, and I, I love the way you're, you're handling those little kind of complex, those clump, complex clumps of vegetation. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. And, and is this a, a four point is behind you? Oh, um, oh yeah, thank you. Um, so in the map, I didn't finish. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, hold on, one second. I'm, I'm hearing kind of a strange noise. I'm the only person in the house and I'm hearing kind of a strange noise behind me. I'm just going to go check to make sure that everything's okay. And I'll be right back. No problem. Um, so yeah, um, tried to keep note about what was the most common kinds of trash. I did a mask count about how many masks I picked up because masks are the new trash that is everywhere. There were 12 that day, um, which I was none too thrilled with. Um, and then on top of that, I went back to, um, and, and a friend was in town, so we took a walk. And while we were walking at my site, I expected it to be clean since I'd cleaned it just, you know, six days earlier. And nope, it was dirty all over again. So I was like, really? Um, and, um, and then because I know some people sometimes will have challenges when they're cleaning things up outside, I tend to have a lot more pain. So I can't do as many prolonged cleanups as I used to. So I decided to make myself an ouch map so that I can figure out where the pain is and then what to do about oh. it. So that's kind of fun. Um, and then coming up with some ideas about what to do. And then with all of the little tiny plastics, I decided to vent about that one. So my options with the plastic are to either bring a rake, you know, sit down and pick up all of them in one little area or scream into the void. And I think that the last one's probably what I'm gonna have to do from now on. Oh, to answer your question, Jack, uh, four, four Point would be right here. Um, I just didn't draw it yet. Uh, so I walked towards Four Point and then oh, stopped. Ah, oh, got it. Yeah. Um, I'll try to be fast. Um, let me oh, see. No, 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 no. Take your time. No, seriously, take, take, take your time. Because this is, this is, it's been a while since we've got a chance to kind of geek out in here. And I'm, I'm really enjoying kind of seeing what your brain is, is, is playing with. Uh, um, also, uh, before we go on, um, the next time, you go out and do one of these major cleanups that comes along with its own sort of ouch regimen. Um, on behalf of the Nature Journal Club, um, we would like to um, order a post. Um, a, uh, we, we will pay for a, 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 a post cleanup massage for you. Um, so let me know again your your massage place of choice. Um, you go out and bust a move, and then um, on behalf of the Nature Journal Club, um, we will uh, we'll, we'll we'll pay for trying to get your back um, back and happy. Thank you. I will really appreciate that, <laughs> and I will. And I'll invite people to come hang out with me while we clean up. We'll all clean up together. I thought it was good timing that you were drawing. Um, underwater today because um, my friend, well, our friend Amy Schlesser was in town. And so we went to visit the Academy of Sciences. And that's what we were trying to do was look at all of the fish in that one tunnel. Um, so I, the fish moved so fast that I had to start sketches and abandon them. So that's what I was doing for most of that day. I was just trying to catch them, but it was fun looking at all of the different patterns that they have. And then you answered my questions. I had some questions here about light and then you just answered the colors and everything else like that. So oh. now my, my question, <laughs> is like um, our values more important. That, and, and then you answered that too with the whole counter shading, um, more important than colors underwater. And so, yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. I was practicing drawing the octopus. Um, we saw the octopus at the last minute and I didn't get to draw her, <clears throat> but I'm trying to make a cartoon about what happened that day um, where we were wondering where octopus oh, was. Um, and then we found her hiding back here in the corner and all of a sudden, and this one I didn't draw, but all of a sudden, all of this, this stuff came flying out that looked like confetti. And it, it, and then we got a closer look and it looked as though, you know how octo octopi have these suckers on them? Yeah. Well, it looked like, like a layer of skin off of the suckers and they went flying out like confetti from where she was hiding. And so we're not sure what was going on if she was shedding or what we think maybe she was shedding. Wow. And then she came out and began, um, and kind of swimmed around for a second, but then her skin changed texture <clears throat> so that she was spiky all over. And um, and so, yeah, it's, um, so instead of it being like, you know, smooth and 
this would be sort of an orange color. Then it looked as though there were spikes all over it. And then she turned a bit more pale and she began to go back to her hidey hole on the other side of, or not that, um, on the other side of her tank. And then um, I went and kind of was thanking her for showing up for us and speaking as softly as possible. And then she, um, she stopped trying to go and then she kind of put her eye up right against the glass. And then she, and then she came back out again and I was going, oh. I'm in love with Octoboss. O so, Octoboss or Bossopus? Yeah, exactly. Um, I was asking friends which one they thought was a cooler name. Um, Octoboss. Or... Octoboss. Uh, and, 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 and oh, you're using the uh, dot method for doing a tally, and more people went for Octoboss. Yeah, I, I'm trying to use the dot method. I need to remember how to do like what order the rest of it goes in, but I'm going to practice that later. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I don't, I don't, I don't remember what the order is either. I just do it randomly, you know, just for once you get to. Uh, for my, you know, my five, six, seven, eight, that's a bit, bit, it can be any one of those sides. And as long as you're doing it consistently, it'll be easy for you to kind of glance down at your notes and get that. Cool. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any, any votes on whether I call this one Octoboss or Bostopus, I mean, yeah, I'm just calling her Octoboss for now. Um, okay. Let's see here. What else? So you had Amy Schlesher and Akshay and Gargi. Yes. That was a party. That was a party. <laughs> so, uh, what, so uh, imagine Avea and a critical mass of other really fun nature journalers. That was a good time. Nature yep. journaling at, with a little community is so much fun. Ooh. Um, I just remembered something else. I promised my friends in Last Pencil Miles and Chill, we're talking about drawing people. And um, I'd shown them one of my interesting attempts at drawing Jack. Um, where I accidentally made you look like Mark Ruffalo. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I was going to show a more recent drawing um, that I did of Jack, um, just because. But that makes me look like a, a praying mantis, though. Oh yeah, that wasn't you. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, here we go. Um, okay, first of all, um, oh. Jason says hi. Um, yeah. White transparent also says hi, and Jack says hi. Yeah. And it, it took me six attempts to draw Jack well. Um, so it's just a reminder that like with anything, people miles or pencil miles. So you don't get to draw somebody really perfectly right off of the bat. This took me a lot of tries and seventh might not look like Jack, but yeah, Jack says hi. Uh, that's <laughs> really fun. Yeah, drawing people are, is the hardest thing. Drawing people's faces is the most challenging thing of all the stuff to draw. And the reason is that, oh, before we kind of geek out on that, let's geek out on this. Oh, oh. just, um. The madness continues about trying to identify all of the subfamilies of asparagus. So yeah, uh, this is Avago um, Agavoidae. And so I'm drawing them and hoping to find some good patterns. Then we have Cilioidae over here with the hyacinth. And then over here, we have the beginning of Brodioidae. And I'm using your technique too of the, of the cones. So. Mm. Oh, that's um, really fun. <laughs> so yeah, anyways, what were you about to say? I'm sorry, I'm about people faces. Oh yeah, so yeah, people faces are tough to draw, and the reason is that there's there's there is a oh what fun mental flatline, too many mouth parts. I draw myself as a cartoon. Um, I draw. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> mental flatline. What helps when you're drawing? yourself um start with yourself and then go with friends is that first make yourself into a cartoon find three features of your own face that are either really distinctive or that you're really proud of and you want to remind yourself that you like about yourself and then draw those and that will make you your cartoon more noticeable to yourself so in, unlike this picture usually I draw either the gap in my teeth because that's pretty distinctive I'll draw my eyebrows and then I'll draw my Madagascar right here because I think it looks a little bit like the island Aww. And that's how I know that I'm always, and so I recommend <laughs> everybody else do the same thing with their own faces. That's um, really fun. Thank you. Oh, those bugs. Tell us a little bit about bug night. Oh, yes, that's what I, that, sorry, that's why I keep sharing these. If anybody wants to, there's this one particular lady named, um, named Trisha who does this bug night um, every Thursday night and then also Sunday afternoons. And she will take audience requests if she has it in her collection. And then she'll go over the parts of the bugs. And then you can learn how to draw them from her and everything else. So is that on the uh, Nature Journal uh, community calendar? Um, it's not, but it really ought to be. All right. Um, so uh, could you put me in contact with her? And I'll get her set up as a um, as one of our 
so she can contribute to that. But I think that would be really fun for, for, for everybody. I agree. And then one last thing, because I want to let other people go. Grass Madness, woohoo! This is from a while ago, but I wanted to share it because woohoo, who doesn't love pictures of crazy grasses and their seed heads? <laughs> okay, wow. sorry. <laughs> that, uh, that was not, 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 not to end on a gloomy note. <laughs> okay, you win. <laughs> you win. Uh, that's really fun. Uh, hey, Avea, uh, that was really, really, really cool. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, lots of lots of of just joy wonder stewardship i'm really delighted and impressed um thank you thank you thank you um let's join jack um hey there jack uh, i'm going to um you can unmute and um here's jack hey how are you doing? Oh, wait, you can't, you can't, okay, hold on. Um, one moment. And spotlight, all right, now. There we go. There we go. All right, so I've been, been doing, I've been good. I've been doing some hawk, hawk studies from a big book I got at a book sale. <gasps> oh, look at those eye angles. Isn't that interesting? So it's really on this this little hawk, really forward facing eyes, aren't they? Mm -hmm. This is a prairie falcon, actually. Yeah, so that's a falcon. And then I did some others right here. Ooh, 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 ooh! Oh, this is really cool. Yeah, that that connecting the eye to the beak as you have done. I think is a really good way of kind of making that that kind of angry raptor look. Makes them look mm -hmm. kind of serious. And I've got a mystery on my hands with some more eggs. Right, talk, talk to me. What do you got going I, on? I I didn't get, be able to sketch it because I'll I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, I found another egg whole this time. Um, in the brush and like all the dead pine needles under two huge pine trees um, in our front yard by the driveway. Just my my dad was raking up all the pine cones and stuff. And under that, he found this egg whole. And when we picked it up, it was cold. So whatever was in it probably died already, which is disappointing. But um, we th I think it's uh, my neighbor came over and we think it's a goose egg because he said that's the, really the only big bird that lit. Like it was significantly bigger than a chicken egg and yeah. i think that great horned owl egg is act we lined it up and i think it's the same size so i think that might be a canada goose egg too not a great horned owl egg and i was right before um i shared i ran outside and was gonna get it and it was gone so i gotta um do a little detective mission and see if there's any like fox tracks or something like oh, i'm wondering if like a fox if a fox like stole the egg put it under the brush my dad raked it up. We put it, we set it in the brush so I could journal it. And then we were going to like bury it or something. And when I went out there, it's gone. It was gone. And we found it yesterday. So it could have stolen it in the night. I don't know what happened. Oh, wow. What? I, I, I think that in, the, in your field notes, it'd be really cool to have um, the, you know, that, that whole kind of accounting of events. That's a great mystery. Yeah. That's... And, um, Really I quick, cool. I quick sketched the um, shark and the cat. Oh, that I like it with that 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 three quarter view um, on the shark. That one fin coming towards you. Nice, really well done. And um, I found a little bufo under a dead or rotting piece of wood. I got to do a map on where he was. I haven't done that yet, but, and then I did. Um, oh, on, on, on the little bufo there, on the little uh, toad, it's also cool. You've got, look at those big parotoid glands behind the eye. And I love the way you did that. Um, that this, so we've got a three quarter view looking down on this. So the far eye, you're not able to see into the eye. The close eye, you're looking up and seeing that 
um, you're in order to do that, you need to really understand um, to be able to see and, and understand. So that's the, the angle that you chose really helps us see the structure of this thing. Um, very well handled. Very yeah, well handled. I, this, this um, the toad and frog uh, workshop you did a couple of weeks ago was really helpful. I did the, um, with my non photo blue pencil, I did the little cylinder connecting the two eyes yeah. so that they're even. And then I did the just the little hump because you can't see the other eye from that three quarter view. Ooh, really, really strong work, Jack. Really strong work. And I also did a little um, secret plant thing with my brother. I haven't finished it yet, but where we do the map and then we have to hand each other our journals and then try to find the plants in our yard that we did. Oh, good. So he hasn't found this one? Uh, we haven't finished it yet, and then we're going to go hunting for them. I have—I actually think he did find them. Uh, we showed each other the map. One. I just—I haven't put in color yet, so. That's 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 cool. I really uh, I really like the addition of the map. Also, nice use of metadata down there. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, um, a couple of days ago, I there's a tulip in our front yard, and it was closed up. I got up early on Saturday. Um, so at 7.20, so like about every half hour I sketched it. And I found like, um, because the sunrise is on the opposite side of the house that it's on. So it's the flower, the house, and the sun rises over here. So as the shadow got smaller and smaller, when the light reached the flower, it, it opened. Oh, 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 oh. So this was early in the morning and then still closed, mostly closed and then the top of it. Then still closed and starting to open and then fully open. At, at what point did the light get to it in this? It was eleven thirty. Point to which one? When it started to. Open. Oh, wow, wow, wow! Look at that. So, and how interesting to have this be. Yeah, so it's there in the shadow. The second the sun hits it, and kaboing! How long between? Much time was there between those two views? On the open so board. the last, it was exactly an hour, 10.30, still closed, but sunlight getting very close, 11.30, the sunlight has reached it, it is opening. Yep, and, and, then, and then the drawing to the right of that one, how much time between the, between the final most open one and the one where it's starting to open? I don't know why I didn't write the time on that one, but it was probably, I had a timer, so it was probably about 40 minutes after, 40 or 30. Or 20 uh, maybe so, so when, once it starts opening, it's opening really fast, but it's mm -hmm. waiting till that light. Wow. I, it, you know, isn't it interesting that you are also tracking the sunlight on that? What an important clue. It just sort of shows me the way that you're thinking really ecologically as you're, you're looking for mysteries in the world around you. And you're paying attention to a whole bunch of different sorts of variables that might or might not be relevant. In this case, it was ended up being really relevant. Um, that's really fun. That's really fun. Yeah, and then the last thing was at the golf course, I found another canvas back, this time female, and I was just kind of following her around. Um, this is right before she kind of waddles into the pond. Ooh. That's a quick, quick side view and then some unfinished. Yeah, and so folks, a couple of things here. One, I'm really enjoying this, uh, this view from the back with that beak just slightly visible around the side of the head. Isn't that, that is so ducky. Um, and also for the canvas back, um, notice on the one on the right there, that slope of the forehead. You can also see that in the, the sketch that doesn't have the pencil on it yet and just the, the preliminary sketch up there on the top of the page. Look at that big, it's like a big ski slope down the forehead of the duck and onto the beak. That is something you're, you're, you're thinking to yourself like, wait, I've seen ducks before, their ducks beaks aren't shaped like that. Well, canvas back beaks are. And Jack's sketching a canvas back beak here. So everybody take a close look at that big kind of ski slope face, right? And then I'm going to, um, if, if I um, canvas 
back duck. All right, so this is just sort of evidence that, uh, I'll put in head. Um, yeah, here we go, here we go, check this out. So I'm going to do a, I'm gonna do a quick uh, screen share here. Canvas back duck head, look at this dude, all right? Um, See that slope? That's what Jack's got there, that big slope there. There's a very similar looking bird. This one here, even though it says canvas back identification, that is not a canvas back. That looks like a redhead, right? Notice how it's got a big forehead that comes down to a beak. That's there to be a bird that kind of looks like a canvas back, but is not a canvas back. So it's not, um, this is uh, on the uh, Cornell uh, website. They have not misidentified this. This is gonna be in there that they just, the photograph that they're putting into like, here's a duck that looks like a canvas back. But look at that head profile down and out. Look at the canvas back again. Whoosh, whoosh. Now stop share. Let's see Jack's sketch again. Check this out. Jack is, very precisely observing nature uh, around him. Jack, you've got duck drawing chops. Thank you. That's nice. That's really nice. That's strong work. Very strong work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's uh, join Ray Bonto and see what's happening in your journal. Um, Ray Bonto, you can now unmute and you are spotlighted. Hi, good to see you. It's very good to see you too, my friend. So this was your shorebird class. Oh, see, you should have been teaching the class because I like your bird better than what I got. Um, really nice value range, that little subtle shadow on our little friend there. Um, nice punching in the darks. Very strong proportions. Those are great proportions. Little semi-palmated. Yeah, oh, they're running around. No, again, no, nice angles, nice, nice proportions. Thank you. Um, that's it. Um... As for my nature journal, um, I haven't got much either. This is um, some trees that strangely stay red. They're beech nuts. Um, beech nut trees. Oh, uh, what are you doing to get the texture up there in the branches? I like oh, this. Oh, just dabbing. Just sort of dab, dab, dab? Yeah. Nice. Nice work. Like how those, those trunks disappear into those leaves. I also like the little bit of dark along the side of the trees. That little bit of shadow on the edge there really helps kind of turn that form. Otherwise, it would feel like a kind of a gray vertical stripe. But that little bit of shadow um, is very helpful. Yeah, and yesterday I went, decided to go a little far. Um, Beddington Park, I hadn't been there for over a year. So I decided to visit. Mm. Um, well, that now is a bit of label torn off from, from my pen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I saw some mallard ducklings. That's cool. They've got really neat patterns. Such different patterns than adults. Yeah. They're just that big. Um... Ooh. Ooh. That's, that's really fun. I like this. Oh, hey, um, I've just found out that it's quite possible that in 2023, I am going to be in England. Um, and should I come there? Um, I would really like to make to to plan some time for the two of us to 
go out and do some nature journaling together. Hope so. Uh, so once my, as my uh, trip kind of gets more, uh, um, you know, hammered out, um, I'd love to kind of explore that with you because um, I, it would be so much fun to go um, just uh, geek out together in person. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, this is a coot running around. It really has that coot posture. Really good job on the angle on the back there, that, that kind of coming down the head, that little V between the back and the neck. That looks so cootie to me. Really feels cootie. Uh, uh, as Susan Beckart is also saying, yeah, I was, I was thinking coot looking at that. Just that little shake. Um, now the coots, have you seen them do that thing where they sort of stand up in the water and start flapping yeah. running along? Yeah. Yeah, it was doing that thing. And it was making thousands of um, splashes, one oh. after the other. And then it just springs um, up onto, onto, the bank. The, onto the ground. Oh, splatter, 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 splatter. That, that, like, hold, hold, hold the page still. Um, okay, so here it comes. Splash, 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 splash. Kapung. Oh, that's cool. That is really fun. And also just think about kind of visually communicating information. We really kind of get this coot charge with those, those sort of splash events. So you can kind of get the idea of what's going along that. And then, oh, that's great. That's really fun. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, and um, as, as as this trip kind of gets becomes a little bit more concrete, um, I, I may be doing a, um, a, 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 a a keynote at a at a conference in England. And but I would like to either probably before that um, head down to your area to find a place where we could. We could meet and, and hang out. I would really love to do some nature journaling with you uh, in the field. Me too. All right. Keep doing this work. Uh, you're, you're really developing powerful, powerful skills of visualization. Just that, that, that you know, you, you, that coot drawing that you did, there's just sort of a moment of coot and both Susan and I look at it and they go like, that feels like a coot. And then that visualization of charging across the water and then kaboom up there onto the bank um, really shows that your ability to explain things visually is developing so well. A big part of what we're doing is we're developing visual thinking skills. And that is going to be incredibly powerful um, going forward. You, you're going to find there's going to be so many ways and places that those that skill set kind of comes comes into place. Um, hey, thank you. Great to see you. Um, let's join Susan and then the Schoen family. Um, uh, let's see. And spotlight. Um, Susan, you can now unmute. Hi, I think we've been having a little bit of a fight behind the scenes of trying to move to the end of the line here because um, I, w I was figuring to let, to let, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but uh, so if, if, if the show would like to, would like to go first. I no, 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 it's, it's, okay. it's quite, we're, we're good, we're good. Okay. But, um, okay. what, isn't okay. it, there, there have been so many kind of, cool things happening in this share yes um, this, this this community's got game what have you been looking at i've been sitting on this for a while oh okay i'm going to tear down my screen here so that we can make whatever you put up a little bit bigger I'm very excited um you've got our attention okay so <laughs> i've been geeking out yes yep um, yeah been geeking out on our local sumacs, which are very lovely plants that right now don't have any leaves. The leaf, I'm mean, honest, the buds are like, I mean, this is from, this is from like almost a month ago. So the buds are really 
really, really swelling. Like they're going to be leaves pretty soon. But um, I always have found them very interesting, very charming plants. And I thought it'd be fun to check out. We have two species nearby, the smooth sumac and the staghorn sumac, which are really soft and fuzzy and fun to pet. And you can guess why they're called staghorn sumac, because it's very much like the velvet on a deer's antlers. Um, yeah, so I was, I was drawn and I'm like, was really intrigued that they, they make these really, really cool, very thick stems that come up and, and, uh, and you know, and the buds, it's just a very distinctive, very, very interesting sort of plant. And so I was looking at the buds and trying to see if I could figure out how can I tell them apart, you know, at different times of the year and stuff. And as I'm drawing them, I was like trying, I just was trying to pay really close attention to where the buds were positioned on the stems. And I started to realize that um, they're not just like going back and forth. They're making a sort of a, a spiral around the stem. Uh, right? You might be able to guess what I'm getting at, where I'm getting to. Um, and it's making a right-handed spiral. So it's, uh, well, yeah. So if I take my right hand and I wrap my, my fingers around the direction that the spiral's going, then the, the spiral's going up and my thumb is going up. And so it's a right-handed spiral. If, if it were going down, I'd have to use my left hand to do that. So it would be a left-handed spiral, right? So start paying attention to, well, what if I look down the stem from the top and I look at where those buds are? And uh, so I realized that like you know, the, the buds, it's not, it's not like 180 degrees around the stem. It's not a quarter of the way around. It's about a third of the way around, but not exactly. So if you look down the stem, I tried to sort of label these, um, you know, starting from the top and going like one, two, three. Um, you, you don't actually see this because the buds are all, you know, kind of the same distance away from the stems. They're all kind of lined up on each other and you don't see this, but this is sort of representing, so you know, I can't read what I have got here, but you got like your one, two, three, and then the next one's a little bit further. It's a little bit more than a full turn around and it goes around like that, right? So I'm thinking, is this like this angle? So and basically each bud, like you go up the stem and you rotate around a certain angle to get to the next bud, right? And that angle is a little bit more than a third of the way around. So let's figure, well, let's, 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 let's be, let's be like, so let's give it a name so I can talk about it. Is that angle possibly related to, let me get, wait a minute, wait a minute, there we go. Is that angle possibly related to the golden ratio? Because that the angle, the, the angle that is associated with the golden ratio. Wait a minute, are you then putting that in with gold paint on your page? Well, yes, of course. I mean, how can you? Of course, can you, of you, course you did. <laughs> and, also, <laughs> and, and also, just because I'm just because I'm did. just because I'm I'm pedantic, uh, I'm not only using radians, but I'm also using tau instead of pi, um, because you know, why should you measure your angles in degrees when you could measure your angles? I did concede to put some degrees in there, but. Um, <laughs> It's, this is this is um, tau is tau is a mathematical constant. Some of us think that pi is the wrong mathematical constant to use, and we should be using tau, which is two pi. So, um, but two pi radians would be a full time around the circle. But if you divide by one plus the golden ratio, um, you get this. So the idea is that theoretically, and, and again, this is this I do not know if this is true at this point of the angle in question, but if this is then if you look at the smaller angle here that I have divided by the larger angle that is the sort of remaining amount, mm -hmm. that is the same proportion as this larger angle would be to the whole circle. And that's the same kind of proportional relationship that the golden ratio has. I'm not sure if I should explain now or not, but basically it's so, um, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know how much I should explain of that, but it's a special, a special constant that shows up in nature a whole lot. So I thought, well, how can I figure out whether the angle in question is actually the golden ratio or is close to it, or is the golden angle, I should say. Uh, and so I thought, well, obviously I need to measure the angle between the two buds more precisely. So I started speculating, how can I do this? Oh. Um, because they're not just pointing out from the same place like this. They're, they, you know, it's one, one above the other and then pointing out a certain place, right? So I'm thinking, right, 
how can I how can I work that? And, and by, but well, I should say by, by the way, right? The reason that the, if you sort of were to push these together, you get the shape looks a bit like a pine cone, or the kind of shape that you get if you look at like the seeds of a sunflower, right? Which are those golden spirals, the spirals that you get. They relate to the Fibonacci sequence, and all of these. Very standard. We can go into in detail, but but there's 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 a connection there, and like this this angle shows up in nature for a reason. So I'm like, how can I figure out if that's the case, right? So I'm like, okay, so maybe I could like take a piece of cardstock and I could cut it, you know, and so like see if I could measure the angle this way. And I thought, okay, that would give me the angle, but uh, that would give me those angles. But A, it's it's fiddly, which is sort of annoying. And uh, by, by fiddly, you mean? Fiddly, I mean like it's going to be a lot of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, and, and <laughs> it sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> um, but also, I also realized, and going, going back and looking at the Sumex more, that there is a huge difference in the distance between those nodes, between the lower down the stem and higher up. That they're close, higher up the stem, they're much, much closer together. So, if I was going to do something like that to try and measure this angle between these buds, it, it, would, it would be just really frustrating. Um, and, and also, I would realize that. I, I would likely get a large amount of measurement error because it's hard to tell exactly what direction the bud is pointing yeah. out from the stem. Right. Right? right. And but more significantly, you know, error I can deal with as long as there's about as much error above as below. That's fine. But more significantly, I think it's very likely that I end up with a bias where I might consistently measure those angles, either off often too low, or might measure them often too high, and I wouldn't know that I was doing that. Um. So I said, well, what can I do instead? That and what, what can I do that will be both less work and maybe avoid that issue? And I realized, well, what I could do instead is basically um, look at the angle between lots and lots and lots of the, of the buds as it spirals up the stem, which has the advantage that maybe I can actually measure that angle less precisely, but still get a good result. So what I worked out is that if I count a number of buds or a number of gaps between buds that is a Fibonacci number, then if the angle in question on average is the golden angle, then uh, I should get a, just, just about a whole number of turns around the stem and, this, and the bud that's at the top of that stack should be pointing almost the same direction as the bud below. And the number of times it goes fully around the stem would also be a Fibonacci number, but it would be two Fibonacci numbers down from the one that I get. And so I don't know if I might be. No, 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 no. This, this is so, uh, and this is something that I've that you can you can find on a bunch of different plants. Yeah. This this you know number uh, from you you go from one node to the next node. So you're not you're not recounting the node that is directly above. The one where you had just counted, um, because that's already you've already counted that place. But yeah, that number then between right. the, until until you kind of get up to where you'd see that again, it's a number on the Fibonacci sequence, and then two numbers below that. And and I right. never have known that that is due to the mathematics of the golden. That 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 is specifically on the assumption. So if this angle, this average angle between one bud and the next is the golden angle, which is connected to the golden ratio, then that would be true. If that angle isn't, I mean, if you know, for instance, we see plants where there's just like, it rotates 180 degrees around and there's the next leaf and then another 180 degrees, basically in other words, leaves that are truly opposite leaves just sort of lie in a flat plane. And then you don't get that phenomenon. So if the angle is different, then you're not gonna get that same phenomenon. Um, and and the, the, you know, depending on what the angle is, that would determine how many times can I go around the stem in the time that it takes to go up a certain number of butts. So I, so I basically decided, okay, I can find enough of these, the, these stems, a lot of times they come up to about, maybe about up to my waist or maybe up to about my shoulders as a single, very thick stem. And then sometimes you see them branching and you only, and, 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 Older ones will branch more, and those are the ones that have the fruits and things. And I was, I'm sort of intrigued by the fact that that so many of these just have the single stem and don't branch. Uh, so I figured, um, well, I'll stick, I'll confine my attention to just the ones that are a single stem, because that's going to be easier to keep track of this. 
Um, so which means that if, if, if things change when they start branching, then I don't know. We'll see. Limits to my, my science, right? Um, yeah, what I'll do is I'll, is I'll start at the tip, but I'm not going to start at the, node, the very, very top because I can't tell what direction it's pointing. So I'll start at that one. And then I'll sort of work my way down the stem and I'll count 22 nodes because 21 is a Fibonacci number. And if I go 22 nodes down, then basically that means that the gaps between the nodes, there's been 21 of them. And I'll count and I'll sort of just, just keep, and then I'll work my way up and I'll just count as I spiral around the stem, how many times do I go all the way around the stem? And also if I make an extra quarter turn or a half turn, I'll, I, can, I, can, I think I can visually estimate that reasonably well. <laughs> so in other words, if, if, if it ends up not being a whole number, I should be able to tell and be reasonably accurate, right? So this, this was all some speculation I was thinking about, right? It took me a little while to actually do it because I wanted to- Oh, you've it. done this? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, bring okay. it. So, so little, 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 little side interlude here because then I found a cool sumac that was, that was um, uh, fasciated and that was really, really cool. So I want to keep track well, of that. I like the cross sections on this. Oh, that was really fun. Yeah. Oh, I really do cool. like these cross sections. So you see what she's <laughs> yes, got. Yes, I'm measuring in inches. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll forgive you this time. But this this was, I did this before you chided Ravanta for that. So I'm sorry, next time I'll do that. Um, uh, but yeah, but, this was, this but, was but, really fun. So folks, see what she's got going on here. So those little ovals off to the right, those are, if you sliced it at that point where you see the line and then look down on it, that is the cross section shape of it. So it's going from round to more oval. So this is a really, really cool way of showing. It uh, starts off round, like a normal sumac starts yeah, off round. And yeah. then it you know, gets weird and flattens out and then it flattens out some more and it kind of gets indented a bit. And then it really gets weird. And then up here it was like really, really funky looking. Uh -huh. and, and then there's this little like little round tip again at the end and I don't know if that's going to keep growing normally or if it's still going to do this so I'm, I'm very keen to find out it has lots and lots of buds at all different places and they're not in any kind of like logical pattern and I, but they're all smaller than the normal buds so this um, is 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 fasciation fascination Yes, well, I, I'm I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a kind of well, I shouldn't say connoisseur. I'm a bit of a of a I've 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 seen this happen in a couple of flowers, just out on my walks and things, and so I sort of pay attention and, to it and look and, for and it. Poison oak will do this too. Well, poison oak's related. Oh boy! Cool. That's in the can tell you it's in the same family. Um, but also I've seen it in dandelions and and once in a black-eyed susan, which are both asteraceae. So. Um, it happens. And also you do see sometimes if you go to like the Harbor store and you see like the cactus on sale as little house plants. Maybe if you guys are in, in, in the, you know, in, in the Southwest and you see them for sale as not house plants, but they'll still sell, sometimes they'll sell crested cactus, which is the same phenomenon. So that's a <laughs> side thing. So that's why I sort of got interested in, in, in this, but, um, yeah. So anyway, it was it was uh, yeah, that was very so that was a very fun little little, little side thing because I'm interested in the sumac, uh, and I know and this is very easy to, to get to, so I'm going to keep watching it throughout the year and see how it grows. Um, but uh, Ivea is saying to you know, look for this. Yes, I, if anyone has examples of of um, fasciation or, or cresting in plants, I, it's very fascinating. I think I have to see because with flowers, it's super weird. They they sort of form an oval. And when you see it on like a, on like a, you know, an, an Asteraceae flower, it's really, it makes a little oval and all the petals come out. And it's exactly the thing that you talk about what not to do when you're trying to draw a, a flower viewed from the side. <laughs> the petals are all supposed to point toward the center. Yes, it's yes. exactly not that. And okay. Yeah. Weird. So if you ever see it, like a dandelion, there's so many dandelions out. I always look at the dandelions because once in a while I see it. Anyway, so <laughs> a little side note about weird, weird sumac um, because I love, love weird sumac and weird plants generally. But then fast forward this many pages and I went and I counted some sumacs. <laughs> so I sort of made my, my process more precise and I just made sure I wrote it down, right? So I basically started from it, if I found a sumac stem that was tall enough to have at least 22 nodes, um, and then I did not, start, did not start from the top, the tip one, because the top bud sort of points upward and I can't really tell what direction it's pointing. 
So the next one down. And then I'd sort of work my way down the stem counting 22 buds counting this one. And also, I love the way you're, you're, you're describing, you're, you're showing the process in this too. Well, yeah, the thing is if I miscount, then I get a number that's totally, totally doesn't fit with the rest of the data. So I got to make sure I count it right. Right. Oh, um, and then and then I and then I sort of make note of the last the bottom bud in there, and what direction it was pointing. And then I sort of run my fingers back up the stem, following the spiral of the stem, and just count every time I went one full turn around. Mm -hmm. I kept doing that, yeah. and then I got to the top one, and then I said, "Okay, now is this pointing the same direction as the the bottom the twenty second bud that I counted? Or if it's not, then how far off is it?" And I basically said, "Is it is it is it exactly the opposite direction, or is it?" You know, 90 degrees, or is it um, three quarter turns, 270 degrees? Um, and keep track of that. And so I looked at, I had two, I had two, gr two groupings here. I, I, I wanted to sort of find some samples that were like, I couldn't easily get a random sample because I'm not going to just go tromping around all over random places in the pine bush and get ticks all over me. But I found some ones that were near the trail that were easy to do. Um, so I found this one cluster of staghorn sumac that are all kind of pretty close together by a trailhead. And I did this for, I think I had 15 of them. And this was interesting. So remember I said that if that angle of rotation is the, um, is the golden angle, I should get very, very close to eight full turns. Mm -hmm. okay. like if you, I think it should be like less than a degree off, basically. It wasn't. Almost every single one that I looked at had eight and a quarter full turn, or eight, that is eight and a quarter turns. So that angle is slightly more than the golden angle. Just a little bit. And, and, I, and the thing is, is so, and I'm so working out, okay, it's like, what's the error? I did some little calculations over here, worked out what the error would be. Basically assuming that I'm like reasonably accurate, um, you know, but, but off by, it could be off by 90 degrees. 90 degrees in 21, nodes means that I that the angle in question is off by about 90 degrees divided by 21, which is a um, little under five degrees, basically. So um, I could be off by five degrees, maybe, in and terms of the measurement that of that. Is, isn't five degrees within your margin of error? Well, that's what basically saying is that my margin of error is about okay. five degrees. Okay. For the actual, for for the for the the just just the angle between one spot and the next, and I thought about it, I'm like, okay, do I feel confident that I could have measured those individual angles to within five degrees? Probably. So may, maybe it would. It, so at some point, I probably should try actually measuring the angles between individual nodes and see if I get anything different. So this is the thing. So I had this one bunch of staghorn sumac did this. The a different area, a different place. I found a whole bunch of smooth sumac, and I measured them. And look at that, there's much, much more variation in them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But still they're, well, they're kind of clustered between the eight and eight and a half, or eight, eight and eight and a quarter turns, right? Um, so my conclusion is, is I'm not at all convinced that that angle of rotation is exactly the golden angle. Um, I don't think I could prove that it is exactly that in any case, because that would be, I can't measure it with enough precision to be certain that it's not like half a degree off from that. Um, but um, uh, the, the staghorn sumac definitely was like significantly higher, but also the staghorn sumac that I looked at was all kind of clustered around the same area. And I think it's very possible that they're either um, a sort of clonal colony because they do spread by underground rhizomes or that some of them are seedlings of the others. Mm -hmm. Actually, now I say that I realize not, not a single one of those has any has any signs of old um, berries. Mm -hmm. so maybe they haven't produced any seedlings, but they might all be siblings. So the point is, they may be closely related. The ones that I measured on this one are more spread out along the trail, and so they might be not quite as closely related. So I was sort of where was I speculating on? That? I think I was speculating on that here. Uh, that is 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 the fact that one of those clusters are closer together and possibly more related wow. that explain why there's less variation in there and also had a weird um, outlier here. Um, <laughs> okay. And so I also felt like I needed to sort of show what they look like overall. Um, okay. I had to have a picture in there because I had a picture. And it's more speculation and sort of thinking, okay, so 
even if the angle that we're talking about isn't actually the golden angle, how much does that, how much could it be off, but still produce an effect like what we see in pine cones and pineapples and sunflower seeds and that, that sort of interlocking mm-hmm. spirals mm-hmm. effect that has the Fibonacci ratio in terms of the number of spirals. Uh, so that's going to require some, I have not uh, yet, yeah, but I need to play around with some calculations and see how close that angle has to be for that phenomenon to actually like be apparent. Um, but yeah. yeah well, fun. and can we ask uh, also just a, 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 a sort of thinking uh, or visualization question here. I'm noticing that your smooth sumac points are in blue and some of the questions and exclamation points are in blue and that the staghorn ones are in oh. orange and some of the question marks and exclamation marks are in orange. Are you color coding your questions and excla- your exclamation points and question marks relating to different species and that then ties into the graph? No, that would have been really clever. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. just using the same no, what, okay. what happened was, is I actually took the, what I did the sagworm sumac first, started writing up some notes and realized, oh no, I haven't got room to put the, um, the smooth sumac, so I tried to squeeze it up here. And then I wrote all these questions out and I thought, how can I tell which ones are the questions, which ones are the answers? I know. Let me put them as exclamation marks for notes and question marks for questions. Oh, okay. Let okay. me use some different colors just so it looks got nice. It. Got, <laughs> it, got, it, got, yeah. it, got it, got it, got it. All right. But I should also note one other thing. You can go back to the first, where is the first? There's lots of pages in between. Notice how I mentioned the, the, the right-handed spiral? Yeah. So, and in, in both of these pictures, if you really look at it, you can sort of see that it, if, you, if you sort of turn your hand in the direction that the, the buds are, are going as they go up the stem, yep. you use your right hand and you say, and your thumb points upwards, so it's a right-hand spiral. And if you tried to do that with your left hand, it wouldn't work because it's a right-hand spiral. Well, it turns out once I started actually looking at them, that about half in each of these groups is actually making a left-handed spiral. And so I made a, made a little dot in the dot for the left-handed spiral oh. for each one. So as it turns out, that does oh. not seem to be okay. a That's... tendency for it to make a right-handed or left-handed spiral. It just does whichever one it does, apparently. <laughs> Oh, that is really fun. Um, 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 so the um, I've also learned so, so, that yeah, definitely um, plan for a bigger book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I'm loving here is that you, you're, you're this investigation. There's a bunch of still open questions here, but you've you've even uncovered more questions in doing that. Which oh yeah, a proper, a proper answer to a question ought to produce at least two more questions, right? <laughs> that's right. So um, Emmanuel Kant uh, has the uh, this idea of the, the the principle of question propagation, and Kant's principle of 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 of, of question propagation is that um, every answer given on principle of experience begets a fresh question. And um, here we haven't even answered it and the fresh questions are already popping in here. And this is really fun. This is, is, is really fun. <laughs> um, so I have a, um, I have a schedule question for you. Um, are you free on June 9th at the at 10 o'clock, our regular nature journal workshop time? Uh, as far as I know, yes. Um, what would you not- think of doing a, um, a, a nature journal club workshop with me on just ideas of kind of geeking out with, with math and nature journaling? And sure see if we can kind of brainstorm a bunch of strategies of, of how to kind of, how to kind of get more sort of playful math kind of coming into our nature journal pages. Um, that would be really, really fun. 
Um, sure, yeah, I'd love to. And then you and me and Avea need to sit, and we need to we need to also sort of talk about, um, I think we need to talk about some, some astro-related things. Um, and I know that I've sort of sat on that email thread, so I will be getting back to you guys about that. My apologies. Um, but with regard to the, the mapping, though, I, I mean, I don't know how you can possibly do better than your um, Nature Journal Connection video where you were showing the stem and leaf plots. Which, when I got to that video and you started doing a stem leaf plot, I screamed a little bit. <laughs> 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 and I will, here's the thing I will say because I, I teach statistics occasionally. Sometimes, not not very often, just when, when they when they give it to me. Um, I don't do a whole lot of statistics as like a general thing. And I teach like how to do a stem and leaf plot. And when we teach it, it's always like, well, here's this data set. Here's all these numbers. Now put them in a stem and leaf plot so you can look at them. And the students find it very boring. And honestly, I kind of find it kind of boring too. It's great. And the thing is, is it hadn't occurred to me exactly why that in particular. So everyone should go watch that video if you haven't because it's great, but, um, <laughs> um, but, but it's, it's the thing that was, the thing that is so strong about that. And I, honestly, I really was trying to figure out if I could work out a way to get a stem leaf plot into this, oh, but yeah, I realized yeah, the data I was collecting. But, but because, and, and especially when you had all those stems. Yes, exactly. And, but, and, and, and believe me, it's a sumac leaf. That would be a so stem and blood, and, and blood own, plot. Sumac leaves are compound pinnate leaves too. Okay. So really but the thing is, what was so great is that it is literally a way to record the exact data without sum, without you know sort of summarizing or removing that precision, but in a way that lets you immediately visualize it as you are collecting the data. Yeah. So if people don't so know what we're talking about, numbers already collected and then doing right down, like why would you bother? Just you know. Yeah. No. So you, but what if you you're do literally lose, right there collecting the data, and you can put and you can then you can see what the data are starting to look like as you are collecting it. That's right. So because what the numbers do, aren't that interesting. What are the numbers doing? That's what's interesting. So. Um, you you lose the temporal relationship between the data, like what the ordinal relationship, like this came first, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And if that is, is something that's important, then then that system isn't as as useful for it. But for so many things, like you know the heights of of flowers in this meadow, um, the uh, which one you measure first isn't important. Um, so yeah, we should definitely include that on that uh, sort of numbers geek out day. Um, so yeah, the stem leaf plot, that was for you. Um, Susan, this was, um, you know how to go down a rabbit hole like nobody's business. Um, and so for, for folks who are watching this, uh, they're, 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 so there are parts of when Susan was explaining this where I was going like, I'm not quite following what you're saying, but this is still really neat, right? So even if we didn't follow all that, what I want you to recognize is just sort of note the joy and the focus and the, the wonder that comes both from, from applying some of these numbers, but also just letting yourself just, you know, free fall down the rabbit hole like that and that is that is some next level um so when i i've sort of talked before about the idea of deep geeking out um mad props for that deep geeking out but one thing i would say so i i was i was wondering how much i should like try to explain about the golden ratio and the fibonacci numbers and things and i thought like well you know this is that that you could take a long time on that but the thing is you don't, it's not like you have to know a lot of like complicated math concepts to be able to do deep peeking out. I was thinking about this because I was thinking like, you know, like how much information should I put in my journal to explain that? And to be honest with you, I was also thinking about like, I'm gonna wanna share this here. So I should think about how I put things in my journal, not just for me to look at, but for you guys to look at. Um, because this honestly, like being able to share these things now has kind of has affected how I do my nature journaling because I'm thinking about who's going to see it besides me. Mm -hmm. And 
that's really good, I think, because it means that I actually explain things better and explain my own thinking, which means that stuff I thought I was going to remember but didn't, I actually did put down in the journal, which is great. Um, but I sort of thinking about it, a lot of times it's sort of a, like when I think about what should I be writing and what should I be showing in here, it's a conversation between me and myself, kind of. And so there's a lot of things that I put in there that's like, if, it, if it's relating to something that I'm already aware of or have been thinking about or a question that I had somewhere else previously, I might not explain what that question is or what that thing is again in the journal because I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's kind of like, so this is sort of like, like I'm geeking out about the golden ratio thing because it's something that I am interested in already know about, but you could be geeking out about something, something else that you're already interested in, you know about and seeing how the thing that you're looking at now connects with what you know previously. And that's more important than whether you know about a specific math concept that relates to a specific thing. So, you know, like, it's cool. Everybody should be interested in the golden ratio and should learn about it. And I'd be happy to explain it at some point. But um, the more important thing I think is like, sort of taking things that you know that are in your brain and connecting it to other things that are in front of you in nature and figuring out how those all interrelate. That's fun. And that, that's where the geeky out is. Excellent, excellent. That, that's, that's very, very well put. Um, and this also reminds me of something that um, it's an idea that is written on the whiteboard out here. So I need to kind of see how I express this. What was this idea? Um, oh yeah, um, was the, the idea is that part of what we're doing in our nature journaling. I have a whiteboard out there whenever it's kind of a cool idea, I just kind of stick it out there and kind of make it visual um, is, is to make your thinking visible to both yourself and others. And when we're externalizing our thinking, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, so more on this on the 9th, we're going to um, have, so on the 9th, I want everybody to come, if anybody has, um, you know, a, a, a miner's helmet uh, or for some, you know, deep spelunking, um, uh, your spelunking, you know, headlamps and protective gear are gonna be very, very useful. Um, on the ninth, and I want to encourage people to join us for that. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm now going to bounce over to the Schoen family. Uh, you guys have been crazy patient with us as we've been doing our deep geeking out here, and um, uh, thank you so much for for waiting. Um, and you all can unmute and I'm going to add you into the spotlight here. And hey there, it's really good to see you. Hi, um, so I did this a little while ago, but um, it's these flowers. I don't know what they're called, but um, I really like this because I feel like it's what you say about um, it doesn't have to be a pretty picture, but like if it could just like um, have as much information as it can, then that's what counts. That's that's right. And, and tell me what um, what were some of the the surprises and the most interesting things that you discovered? Oh, there it just came into focus. Oh, hold on. Um, yeah. Hold it. So for a second, it just came into kind of crystal clear focus a moment ago. Um, maybe hold it back from the screen just a uh, little bit now, maybe bring it towards, we're gonna to see if we can get, at least on my screen, it's not, it wasn't coming into focus and then it just kind of came into crystal clear focus. Um, come on, come on camera, you can do this. But you're, you're absolutely right. It's not about the pretty, pretty oh, it's not about the pretty pictures. There we go. Oh, oh, oh. So I'm, I'm also reading some of your notes. Could you read your notes to us also? Um. So right here, it, um, I wrote about what the smell, a hint of fresh honey, a uh, smell with a little bit of vanilla, a smell of earth and Life, very good smell, but hard to smell. Oh, that's and then a I wrote, beautiful description. I love that 
smell description. Yes, and tell me more. Um, and then I wrote things around it, acorn sticks, plant, uh, plants, uh, broke up leaves and uh, rocks. And then I wrote plants around it. I didn't get to finish, but grass is what I got to. And then um, I wrote how tall it was. It is 15 centimeters tall. Oh, and you're using the metric system. Mad points for mm -hmm. that as well. 15 centimeters tall. And um, this is a really, really useful sketch. It really, you're conveying uh, information about the shape of these leaves, um, the shape of the little clusters of flowers. And uh, that back, um, putting in that, bl that black behind it really makes it pop out, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this is actually a shorter one. We have a bunch of these in our yard. This is more of a shorter kind. Um, like, well, not kind, a shorter one. There's a lot more taller ones that's more like 20 centimeters. Huh. Um, do you think that this was just a young one um, that hadn't grown as much as the others? Or, or do some seem to stop their growth just lower than others? Maybe because most of them are about the same height, like higher than this one, but this one, I think there's a couple others that's more shorter, but it could just be because it's young or I don't know. Mm -hmm. yep. I, I like how you, you, you said it's young or I don't know. So you didn't just stop your thinking at because it's younger you left room for possible other explanations of that. That's very good sort of scientific thinking, um, leaving room for other possibilities. Great use of words, pictures, and numbers. Also, I want to really compliment you on that. Um, your, the things like the, the smell and the things that are around it, hard to put those things into the picture, but by adding those in with the words, then um, you get this whole other layer of information. And how, how interesting that, um, you know, you, you might make a little, um, add to the little note that this one was, you know, 15 centimeters tall and most of them are about 20 centimeters tall. Um, yeah. That was an, an, an interesting observation that you had made, um, but we might forget that later on. Um, I'm, also, um, I, I just want to, to, to note that you've got those leaves at a bunch of different angles, those leaves down there at a bunch of different angles. That is a challenging thing to draw. And what a lot of people do when they're drawing leaves is they just sort of flatten them all out so you sort of see the leaf face on, but you're putting in them at all these sort of different angles that they're sort of naturally coming off of this. And um, that, that shows me that you're, you're developing um, some real comfort with um, how to sketch the different plants and forms that you're seeing. Have you been doing a lot of drawing? Um, not, no, because uh, I tried to do... You've been doing a good amount. Yeah, I tried to do a... Oh, actually, here's... I didn't get to draw because it ran away before I could, but... um. Something really cool happened yesterday. Um, we were doing a little bit of yard work and um, uh, I saw something like kind of popping or something and I thought that it might be, oh cool, it's a frog. But then it came like, it was kind of hidden by grass, but then it jumped out into the open and it turned out to be a mouse. Really? Oh, wow. I really um, like and what so it, it was down in the grass um, was yeah, this... um my mom thinks that we might have disturbed uh the nest while we were um doing some yard work because there was two of them so i ran inside to get my uh nature journal because it, it's a very 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 rare thing to 
see a mouse here because our cat chased the master hunter. Anyways, uh, yeah. and when I came back, uh, apparently the first one had ran away, but then another one, unfortunately, when I was coming, it ran off. And when I tried to find it again, well, I couldn't. Oh, but how is it, do you remember if this was one of the kind of mice with really short tails or was this a longer tailed mouse? Uh, it was, it had very long uh, tail. Mom thought that it might be a kangaroo mouse, but when we looked, um, it turns out that they don't live in Missouri, which is where we live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that was really cool for me anyways, because... I really like mice. Yeah, that's that is very interesting. Um, let, let me. Uh, I'm going to run over to my uh, bookshelf here and see if I can find a particular book that you might be interested in. Mammals of Missouri. We'll have to get that. Wild mammals of Missouri. Trust me, mom will get it before you can blink. Before we can blink. Okay. Oh. This is cool. Oh, Jack, I'm not sure if you're talking or not, but we ha we can't actually hear you. Sorry. Still cannot hear you. But it, it doesn't say you're muted. It just... What about now? Oh, now we can. Yeah, there you are. Okay, great. Um, so it's got range maps. So, you know, where these things are, it has these... Um, scratchboard drawings that are amazing, amazingly good drawings. And for each species in Missouri, it has, um, you know, first just general information about it, the food, the reproductive behavior of it, adverse factors, importance, management control, selected references. For each species, there's a full illustrated plate of the critter uh, done with um, with sort of soft pencil, where they have a drawing of the critter, the details of their feet, the skull, and any tooth details that they have. And so, you know, for instance, voles and things, they, they'll have these little drawings with these. I mean, the, the illustrations, I don't know if this is focused very well. The illustrations are spectacularly good. Here's some stuff about the tracks of these voles. Here's the predators of them. And, uh, you know, for, for every species in Missouri, um, so if you're interested in the little mice and things, um, you know, here's, here's how to tell the, the, the dog skull from a coyote skull. Um, here, how, here's how to age a coyote skull by looking at wear on the incisor and canine teeth. Um, I mean, it's got crazy good stuff in it. Um, and um, so you being from Missouri uh, made me think of, of this, but this is, this is um, let's just kind of go to the more mousy part, those rats. Uh, I mean, look at this little guy. Oh, isn't that cute? Right? Yes. So adorable, right? Um, and it is, it's, it's, it's got tons of great information about all these different little wild neighbors. And look at this one. This one uses abandoned birds' nests. Isn't that fun? Oh, wow. It's the, 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 the pictures are really good, really good drawings. So I thought um, it, 
this, I, I got this book just because the content and the illustrations were so good. And I thought to myself, like, you know, I think I'd better move to Missouri because <laughs> the, you guys have the best mammal book. Um, but if you're living there, I would, I would get a hold of this bad boy. Yeah, so, we'll look that up tonight. Isn't that fun? Uh, I mean, yeah. this is this is this is done. It, it's got just got tons of the kind of old school natural history, um, and that is is so worthwhile. The little just nuggets of of information. Oh, don't go towards the trap. Don't look out. Look out, little guy. Look out. Don't go into the trap. Um, so I thought that that, uh, that might be of use or interest to you. Look at this little dude. Oops. Nice green froze. All right. Um, there I go. Um, um, we were reading this this morning, and for anyone who likes spot me, and we were thinking of Miss Yavinia. Um, this is really cool. It's about people who went through um a lot. I mean, a lot of danger to get um, uh, plants and like study them, and um, uh, they find new species. Like they've dedicated their lives basically to find new plants. Oh, do, oh my do, god! And you think Avea would be really interested <laughs> in checking that out? <laughs> So you know, Avea is crazy into books, and um, and then you you put plant adventure on it, and mm -hmm. that's that's cool. Have have you been enjoying reading um, uh, about those? Uh huh. They're really cool. Like um, so they go through like most of them. Like will like um, they see tigers like they get chased by tigers they they get <laughs> sick it's really cool but like it's and like once we're done with a chapter um i just want to go outside and um like draw plants and it's really inspirational and really cool What's your favorite plant so far that you've read about? Um, I don't know. We were only on the second chapter because we have no idea where it went, but we lost it for a little while. We finally found it. Um, they talked about there's one about it had. Okay this tree that had really big um uh, is it like nut pods that was really cool um they've also talked about um uh, that one was really cool too there's this other one that he saw uh well one adventure uh saw a I'm trying to think of the name was it a sweet pine um it was some kind of pine tree and um he and he finally found one um after a long time and because i think he was from sweden was he the yeah he was from either england or uh sweden and um uh the tree was like uh, 250 feet tall. So, um, to get some of the pine cones, um, he had to shoot them down to get them. It was really tall. Yeah, that's 
<laughs> I just read that right there. Oh. Yeah. He had to blast him down with his gun. Yeah, it was really cool. Oh, it was the sugar pie. That's so cool. That that is really really neat. Now, um, what what is the name? There 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 is a there's a woman who was a botanist, really interested in orchids. She did all this work in the tropics. Um, does anybody know? Um, I'm blanking on her name. Um, she might be in. Um, uh, her adventures might be in in the book, but she discovered all these species of orchids. She was crazy into orchids and did these incredible botanical illustrations um, of 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 orchids. Ah ah. Um, no, that's um, Mar uh, Maria was was Lepidoptera. Um, this is she's sort of on a par with that. Um, I, I, I'm not remembering, but I wonder if if, if this woman and her sketching adventures um, might be um, um, included in in that. Anyway, um, that looks like a really great book, and I hope that you and the family have some botanical adventures um, looking for really mm -hmm. cool plants. Thank you for sharing that with mm -hmm. us. The, the name of that book, one last time. Uh, the plant. The, 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 the plant. Hunters. The plant hunters. Yeah, hunters. All right. Um, oh, you got it. So. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm really, really glad that you um, stayed on to to um, to 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 share that with us. The um, it's really exciting to see your your sketches and your nature journaling observations, and it looks like you're getting really inspired to investigate plants. And I hope that in future. Um, uh, please share any uh, plant discoveries that you make with us. Um, our, our friend Avea is especially going to be uh, curious about that. And something that is going to make her really kind of jam out. Sometimes when you're drawing a plant, you can kind of get in there. And if there's part that's really interesting to you, if you do an enlargement <laughs> of that part that is, is where there is, um, where, where you see something that is really interesting, um, that will make Avea squeal. Um, so thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And um, friends, thank you all so much for being here and for sharing your work, your thoughts, and your ideas. Um, the, I want to just encourage everybody to, to, to keep, to keep your, your, your sketchbook open, keep it accessible to you. And, you know, I, I, I love what our, our last um, guest said about, you know, I saw this wonderful thing. And so I ran back inside to get my journal, right? You want that to be your, your response to finding something cool and let yourself, if you can find a rabbit hole to go spelunking in near you, uh, we can't wait to, uh, to investigate the, 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 the mysteries that you see. Um, I want to give people a heads up about my upcoming... Uh, yes. Oh, hold on a second. Um, yes? Oh. Um, I was going to share something. Um, uh, one more thing. Um, so a couple, like two days ago, um, we found a toad. Oh, oh, look at this beautiful animal. Look at that. Oh, oops, I, there we go. Oh, look at this. The little throat going whoop, 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 whoop. Have you made any sketches of it yet? No, I have not got to. I really do need to. Okay. Oh, uh, you're going to make Jack 
jealous of that. Um, hey, Jack, look at that toad. That is so cool. Um, we'd love to see what you observe by um, investigating this little one in your journal. That's a really, f did you find that in your garden? I did. Uh, we have an eye patch, so yes, iris. And there was one, no, but um, that I found out this morning. So when we first got him, he was a little bit more blacker. Um, and, uh, but then this, but then he kind of turned greenish, but then this morning he was blacker again. And then right now he's, um, more greenish again. Interesting. Okay, back in the page. <laughs> Do you think that that I know, has... So I don't know if that... I don't know if that means, like, maybe he's hungry or something. We put oh, plenty of worms in there. It would be uh, interesting... Yeah. So the way that a scientist would kind of geek out on this, and you could actually do some deep geeking out on this, is to... You'd come up with, the, the, the way we do it is we come up with a bunch of different possibilities um, about what could be causing that. So you mentioned one that is a really interesting possibility. You know, it could be that this is hungry and full. So if you catch some grasshoppers and things and you, um, you, you, you watch it and then you put some little uh, grasshoppers in there and it eats the bugs and then it's sitting there kind of going like oh that was great um do you see a, a change in its color then hmm so you you pay attention to that before and after feeding what are some other what are some other possibilities what are some other possibilities that could be involved in the color change i thought maybe was it like sick but oh, it could okay. but like, like one time it was green. The next, uh, that morning it was black, and now it's back to green. I'm like, could a sickness really like go away and come hmm. back that fast? So you're thinking if a virus or a bacteria got into this, it would, you'd be you'd be surprised if its body could clear that in that that period of time. So you'd expect if it was a disease that that would be over a long period of time. See what what you've got there isn't what's a, a, is you, you're saying if it's a disease I would expect to see this and I expected to see this uh, there's certain predictions that you'd make but you're you're not seeing that and then you think hmm maybe that's a little bit less likely that it's a disease right um, you know you, what you can do as what we do as scientists is each one of the the different possibilities we call it a, a, we think of it as a variable. And so another example of one is what if it's in response, you know, those are at different times of the, of the day. So, you know, if you looked at its reaction, the color of its skin in reaction to different times of the day. So recording it at this time, I'm seeing this at this time, I'm seeing this. Another possibility, maybe it's in response to light. So if it's in a dark place, you come in with your flashlight and you check it out. Another possibility could be temperature. Um, so when it's no, different yeah. temperatures. Um, so um, sometimes by, by looking at those different things, thinking to yourself like, if, you know, how, if I, if I, if it was like light and dark, how could I test that? How could I, in a way that's respectful and keeps my little toad friend safe? How, oh, all right. Um, and chatter, because it also, um, uh, how much moisture there is. Like, is, it, is this the color that it gets when it's really dry? All those are different possibilities. So what you'd wanna do is think about how could I possibly test those? I actually wanna invite everybody who's still on in the chat, if you have any ideas of possible things that this could be in response to. Um, and um, so we've got, Moisture. Um, um, Susan is wondering, like, what is the normal color? Um, maybe they can color change their color 
um, in response to things that are happening to them. Like on a, perhaps in terms of, you know, I'm scared, I'm going to turn this color. Yeah, I was just about to say, um, maybe it was to their attitude, like, oh, I'm calm, I'm black, or if I'm, oh no, what's going to happen? I'm green. Mm -hmm. no, that's, see, that's a great thought. Maybe it's sitting in its, so one way of exploring that would be to have it in its cage. And then um, where it's kind of chillaxing. And then to, uh, if you pick it up and start handling it and kind of checking it out, going, hello, little broggy, um, a toad, um, you know, and then does, 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 is that when the color change happens? Um, if you're seeing the color change when it is, when there's no threat around, that would be kind of evidence against that. Um, so Charlotte suggested types of food. Um, so maybe it's in response to hungry, not hungry, or types of food. Um, so you've got temperature, um, how much, how bright the light is around it, um, or dim or dark. You've got um, the amount of moisture. You've got food. Um, he is wondering if do oils from human hands affect its skin? I think that's that's an interesting thought. So perhaps to we, you might do a little bit of research. Is it safe for for the, the toad to have me handling it? I probably want maybe make sure my hands are clean, but probably I don't want to have things like, um, my guess is that like some of our um, hand sanitizers. If I've got like hand sanitizer on my hands, I probably wouldn't want to be holding my little, <laughs> my little toady friend. Um, and Susan saying, maybe we want to wash our hands after we, we, we handle it. It's possible too. Um, the, so it'd be curious to see if by continuing to watch that and also kind of watching, are there any, are there any, uh, ways that you can come up with po more possible explanations for the color change? And then how would, how in a way that is respectful and kind to the little toad, might you be able to test those sorts of things? That could be really fun. Would you be able to, maybe over the next week to explore that and report back to us? Mm-hmm. Um, right. <laughs> and one of the most coolest things about is um, he has like this kind of gold around his eyes. Oh, totally but eyes are beautiful. It's like, they're like a gold, like where your like eyebrow would be like, that's like gold. It's really cool. Also, we gave it a name. Bernard. Oh, what did you name this one? Bernard. Bernard. Bernard the Toad. Bernard the Toad. <laughs> That's really fun. I like that. Um, have Have you and your family read The Wind and the Willows together? I don't think so. That no. might. Now that you've got a toad friend. That might also be a fun kind of literature extension, because um, it's this this uh, the, uh, the toad is this character in it. <laughs> it's really really funny, um, and uh, it's it's a wonderful little adventure story with um, a, a bunch of these different animals, um, and you might all enjoy the, um, reading that together as a family. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And I'll tell you what, next time, um, uh, Van's going to help me remember this. But if you're on and you've got some toad report, because you went last this time, you get to go first next time. So you don't have to wait around. Okay. Okay. Hey, thank you so much for sharing all this, uh, your, your, your observations, your, your plant observations, the discoveries that you made with the mice and also um, your toad. Um, we look forward to um, following up with the toad report. And um, you told me before, but I've forgotten your name. Um, what is your name? My name is Chloe. Chloe, that's right. Chloe. Um, um, Chloe, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, and I look forward to, uh, yeah, uh, for a future toad report. Okay. Thanks.
Oh, hey. and thank you for the book re recommendation. Absolutely. Do you like reading? Um, a little bit. And sometimes it's even more fun to get read to. Mm -hmm. All right. You all take care. And thank you so much. Um, and everybody uh, here, thank you all for being here. Um, I also want to spend, send a, a special uh, word of thanks to Avea Moore, the mad botanist herself, um, for um, supporting us here in these, these uh, um, and um, the uh, uh, so the um, and and uh, everybody be well, have fun. Um, let's. Let's uh, let's keep journaling and 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 use that as a um, as a as a window to find beauty in the world around us and perhaps an inspiration to uh, treat the world and others with greater kindness. And also a special thank you to you, Jack. Um, because not only do you teach these incredible lessons of all the different, like you're so well-rounded, all of these different ideas and different paths that we can all take to connect to nature, wherever each of us are coming from. But afterwards, you also, you spend time and energy and love giving each of us feedback and kindness and support. And that's not something I overlook. And I don't think it's something any of us overlook. So thank you for everything that you give. You give with your whole heart and it shows and you inspire us to be more like you. So hmm. thank you for just being an awesome human being teacher too. Oh. No? <laughs> hey, hey, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Evea. You know, being part of this community and what has grown here um, has really changed me and the way that I, I interact with the world. Um, you also are uh, we, a, a source of, of inspiration to me. It's because of you that there's a trash bag now as a permanent part of my nature journaling kit. Um, yeah. And um, you know, I think we're together, we're kind of exploring best practices in nature journaling, um, but it's also, you know, we're all kind of learning best practices in being a person. <laughs> That's fun. It's fun. We're, we're, you know, and as as we kind of move along, we're going to get better at it. I think we really need to get better at it, and we are, and we will. Um, so, be well, everybody, and thank you so much. Um, and and remember, Eva, um, next time you go out and do that backbreaking work, um, let me know before you can. And on behalf of the Nature Journal Club, we're going to. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll schedule you for a, uh, a, a massage so that, um, they can, uh, get you on your feet again. Thank you. I thank you. I really, really deeply appreciate that. So thank you. Me and my back. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> and, and, and thank you for what you're doing on behalf of, of, uh, of, of nature out there. Thank you, Jack. Take care, my dear friends. Everybody take good care. Bye-bye.